11 Bang Bang Reload Show starts now. And hello, everybody. Welcome back to that show. I'm Garrett, and we have our usual suspects over here. We have Snapper and Duke and Ethan in his new uh, streaming studio. But our special guest down here below me is Iron Wings, and I always have to remember what number it is. So go ahead and give it to us, Wings. That'd be three dash one eight seven, same as my old army unit. Yeah, and tell us, tell us, kind of what got you into firearms? You're the special guest here. What got you into firearms? Where your interests lie, and what you've been studying here lately? So a lot of my interest tends to lie with. Uh, it's kind of odd. I used to really be into cowboy lever actions, uh, revolvers, uh, that sort of thing. I was really into the Wild West era because when I was growing up with my grandfather, that's what he was really into. So the first time I ever met him, he lives up in Stockton, California, and I had developed this kind of fascination with firearms before I met him, which was in the Wild West. I grew up watching stuff like Bonanza, all that and Wild West Tech on the History Channel, which that son of a B word, R.L. Wilson was on, like we were discussing last night. Um, and yeah. um, basically the first time I ever met him, because it wasn't until I was about 13, I get up to Stockton to meet him. I'm wandering around his house because he's outside talking with my parents. And I find this big bookshelf right in his living room because he doesn't have a TV. He's that old school. And on it is this book on the history of the Winchester repeater, like a photo history book. And I pick it up, start looking through it, thumbing through it. So you like those old lever guns, huh? He's standing behind me with a glass of like lemonade that he had just poured out. And yeah, ever since then, it's just kind of, it turned out we had a lot in common, even though we hadn't really met up to that point. And I had just been shooting with my other grandpa who I should differentiate. This is my maternal grandfather. The one I had been shooting with was my paternal. So, mm -hmm. um, lately though, it's starting to shift. I used to be into lever actions. Um, but that was kind of because when I was younger, my grandfather, my, both of them were the ones that cleaned the rifles, specifically the Winchester <laughs> 1894 I have up behind me, mm. not so much the case anymore. So now if I go to the range and I shoot that 30, 30, it's either I clean it or I break it down. Or, well, I clean it or I put it back in the safe. No in between. And because of that, I've started moving on to more modern mill serps, things like uh, Mauser 98s, M1 Garands, and other rifles based off the M1 systems like the Ruger Mini series, the ranch rifles. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what my focus is on my channel is just kind of reviewing the every man's guns, something that any guy will go into a gun shop and find there's a lot of guys that will review like Ron Spomer. He'll go review some of the most unique high end sporting rifles. And there's a million channels out there that'll do stuff like extreme sporting rifles, but a lot of the salt of the earth uh, rifles, you don't really get a look at where it's a lot of guys will just shoot it, talk about it in the basic sense, but they don't look into the action. They don't look into the manufacturing, the history, any of that. Same thing with 22s. I love because they are one of the most overlooked pieces of firearms history or engineering because there's so many unique actions out there. And Absolutely. I've, really, I've really been getting into 22s lately because like one of my friends name of Dan, I go shooting with him regularly. He has a amazing little rifle I'd never heard of before. And it's a Beretta magazine fed 22 rifle that's both semi and mm. bolt action. Oh, yeah, really? Cool. Yeah. That's interesting. I'd like to see what that is. Yeah, Basically, that's cool. How it works is you will raise up the handle for the bolt, and it'll start operating as a direct blowback semi-auto. You lower that bolt, it locks up the system. So you have to pull so back. Acts, and time. Yeah. That's cool. That's when you get a little dirty. We were talking, we were on here the other day, and we were talking, and I think we were all showing our appreciation for the old Marlin Model 60. Uh, mm. most of us, a lot of people started out with that personally, just my opinion. I like it better than the, uh, 1022, just cause I don't like to mess with the mags. I always like the tube mag, but I, is that what's your opinion? So 
I'm kind of more of the fan of the SA7. I grew up shooting the Marlin Model 60. It was probably the first firearm I ever shot. But it does have the unfortunate issue of basically telling on you, as Paul uh, Harrell says, where if you aren't careful when unloading because of the way the action works, there may be a uh, round on the cartridge elevator. All it takes is you getting careless one time, cocking that action, and you have a live round in it, and you don't know it. Whereas with the SA7, because you load seven rounds into the back of the buttstock, and all you have to do is dump it out, Mm -hmm. that you aren't messing around with a loaded firearm around towards the muzzle. Yeah. Uh, That's kind of the same reason. Oh, sorry. No, you're good. So I'll just stick with my little J.C. Higgins pump action 22. I like that little rifle. Mm. Yeah. So That's you're into way. the everyman gun, like you said. So you you have a you. I would say, are you into the uh, what I, I call them the department store guns, the Sears and Robux, the Higgins is the. Yep. And actually, the funny thing is, I the first gun I the first lever action I ever shot wasn't a twenty two. It was actually my grandfather's. 3030 and it was a Winchester 94 clone from Sears and Roebuck under the Ted Williams name. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And it, same thing with the uh revolvers I really like the old like H&Rs or that sort of thing just because it's the same it's kind of the same as the 22s where I noticed a lot of these department store guns you don't really got get a lot of history or knowledge based mm-hmm. on them. So One of the guns, my neighbor, I do some gunsmithing and restoration work in my free time. He had this old Winchester 190 series rifle, a semi-auto 22 that's tube fed. And it was made to compete with the Marlin Model 60. But there isn't a whole lot of history available on it online because it was never really documented. It was just seen as this cheap 22 plinker that you get out of a catalog. Same thing with... um, Like the Rossi 92. The Rossi 92, I was making a video to review it and talk about how people have been talking about the 38 special issue for a long time with them being unreliable feeding it. And one of the things I noticed when I was looking at making that video is you can't find a lot of information about the Rossi 92's history online because there's a lot of conflicting reports of when it was first made and when it first started getting imported. I've heard or I've read from like the 1970s, the early 1970s to the like late 1980s is when it was starting to be imported. So it's just kind of mm-hmm. no one seems to really think of keeping a record or history of these low end or every man guns, you know? Yep. Let's go over here right quick. And we're going to guys, if you got any questions about this kind of stuff, I'm pretty sure you could he could rattle you out an answer because I think last night Snapper said something to him and he gave a date of production and what they were made of and pretty much <laughs> but, yeah he's on a walking encyclopedia now yeah so here we go <laughs> we got in here tonight we have task force tyler we have guards of logs uh jp said hey, let's Garza. go let's go jp uh the mountain man steven m man is in uh and of course we have diane houston's in howdy uh and of course great pilgrims here um we have franklin horst uh gunsmith 4570 made it just in time hi everyone angelica woods is in hello uh victor schultz is in he gives you a flex hey. Hart, hardy nice. hat hardy hat good to see you hardy and uh let's see i'm gonna scrolling through and that's about i think everybody that's in here right now we have uh 24 people in here if you guys got any comments or questions type them in the chat and we will be over in the chat more often than we have been here lately brass is in too brass 762 he said an american 180 was captured from syria from the jihadi hit team and was taken out by the syrian army there used to be a video of talking, talking about that would not surprise me <laughs> and we do that have three military guys here tonight so we might wander off in that direction you, you know them them guys they had a i saw a video of it was the uh it might have been isis or it might have been the rebels but they had a napoleon 24 pounder cannon mounted on <laughs> mounted on the back yeah, of the truck I've, I've seen that picture before and they it's were, pretty amazing yeah, i saw a video and they were they were taking out some pretty good sized buildings with that cannon yeah they were like, wow to be fair i'm sure yeah, it was probably mounted in the back of a toyota hilux yeah. Uh, no, it was actually. 
It was on the back of a bongo truck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Christ. So, yeah. And when they shot that thing, that you could see that whole truck scooted sideways <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> Christ. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I kind of wish I had one of those cannons. How in the world? Did, I guess they took over a museum somewhere. Yeah, well, they the, also uh, had a... You had a bunch of museums yeah. that after the fall of uh, Saddam's regime, they got raided all across the Middle East and basically oh, yeah. weapons just got sold of off everywhere. They I watched you turn on the show. Everything black Ooh, powder. Hi. Hi, everything black powder. We're just kind of, we don't have a real topic here tonight, guys. So <laughs> we're just going to wander around and talk about stuff. Franklin Horse says, my Rossi 92 was the most fun groundhog gun ever in 38. Hogs rolled like a uh, furry action targets. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, back on the whole Syria thing, I'm kind of surprised we don't see more insurgents, you know, getting like detained with things like punt guns or freaking uh, like well oh, rods, I, you know. I saw some pretty interesting firearms there. Uh, got a second. I saw some Stins, some Mark II, Mark mm. III Stins. I uh, saw a mint. Uh, there's this, there's this 14 year old kid, and he drove an ambulance for the rebels, and he was going to buy a gun, and there was a high point there. I kid oh. you not. He goes to buy the. They have these guns laying out, and they're buying them for the rebels, and there's a high point. He's like, <laughs> oh, he picks it up, and I'm like, no, no, keep looking. There's there's a couple more here, and. He comes back later on and he bought a gun and he's like, it's broken. I don't know what's wrong with it. I'm like, well, let me see it. Pulls it out of the hol uh, holster and it is a mint uh, Nazi marked high power. Mm. And he's like, he drops the magazine, unloads it, goes to dry fire. He's like, doesn't shoot. It's broken. I'm like, give me that. Took the rounds out of the magazine, slapped the magazine back in it, dropped the slide and fired it or dry fired it. I'm like, it has a magazine safety so you don't shoot yourself in the toe, which is probably not a bad thing for you people because you keep on shooting yourselves in the toe and shooting each other on accident. And again, but that's not really of, that surprising. There's some weird guns there. Uh, yeah, there yeah, are some really weird interesting guns. guns. Yeah, I mean, hell, that American 180 probably wasn't even a real 180. It was probably like a <laughs> Pakistani, like Dara made one because of direct blowback. That. Automatic 22 probably wouldn't be that difficult. Yeah, uh, Stephen M. Mann wanted to know if the Stins had functional magazines. Even <laughs> they were kind of hit or miss, but it was kind of some of them were pretty good. But then again, some of them were yeah. <laughs> In they other words, had, they were average Stins. Yeah, they were I Stins. Just, I just wish we had the same abilities that they did in Vietnam or World War II, where we can get something like that and ship it home. You yeah, know, like. Right? Oh, I had a, there are so many neat things I wish I could have shipped home. I had a yeah. M16A1 that I'd found. We were digging a mortar pit, and when that cop had gotten attacked the first time, uh, ISIS said one of the ISIS guys had obviously been using an old M16A1, <laughs> and they uh, had thermited. They had thermited all them guns, buried them, and I dug it up. The lower was completely toast. Uh, the upper was bent. The hand guards were burnt off. Spent two months cleaning up that rifle. Took some tent stakes, paracord, and aluminum foil. Made some hand guards. Put it on my M4A1 lower, and I had me a nice little rifle. <laughs> and I There's wanted a video to send... of you shooting that on this channel, isn't there? Yep, yep. I really uh, wanted to send that upper home because oh, I wanted that little rifle. We had a guy in our unit. I won't say his name for obvious reasons, but. Uh... <laughs> Basically, what he did when he was overseas, they were doing some sweep of a town. I can't remember what the specifications were because this has been so long since I've heard this story. But basically, there was a set of insurgents that were loading up fertilizer under the back of a jingle truck. And when they took this group out, the thing was one of the guys was wearing a vest of C4 on him. And had a like original first generation Walther P thirty eight in his waistband, like he was a cowboy. Yeah. yeah. And he had that in the bottom of his footlocker for like six months. And every time he got guard duty and was outside the fob, he'd just go out into the middle of nowhere and plink off a few rounds of nine mil into the desert for fun. Yep. 
Sorry. Duke and I are just down here listening. Yeah, yeah sure you are. <laughs> oh, I noticed that it was it was doing this. Everybody was switching around. You yeah, sure Ethan and I, I think fun, noticed it about the same time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, so, let's read a couple more comments here, guys, and then we'll keep on going here. Uh, uh, Cardi Hardy Hat said, I got a gun shop near me that carries a few of those old Sears and Roebuck type guns. Any special ones to look for next time I go? I believe that's directed to you, Wings. I'd say probably just anything uh, Ted Williams, because usually those are really good quality firearms. Just ma- It's kind of the equivalent of the old Kirkland brand that we have at Costco now. Um, it's the old fashioned version of that where it was basically Winchester Marlin, like the Marlin Glenfield was technically sold under a Ted Williams name, I think at one point. And they are all just like name brand factory, uh, manufactured firearms sold under a generic name at a cheaper price. Hmm. Yeah. My uncle has got a Ted Williams semi-auto 12 gauge and that's a really nice gun. So one of those got the built in choke. You just turned, I forgot what the heck they called that choke, but, uh, yeah, it's a real nice shotgun, and he didn't pay a lot for it. Poly the two. only one I would, only one I'd probably avoid if you guys ever find them is like I like them, but the old H and R's I am very iffy on because my great uncle he lives back in Oklahoma near Lawton. Uh, if you are a military, you know Fort Sill, of course, home of the mm-hmm. artillery, and he lives out there. And I went to visit him one year. He has this old H and R knockoff of the. Smith and Wesson safety hammerless, if you know it, Garrett. Yep. Hmm. And he, my, his daughter, who I'm staying with, um, is having issues with her neighbor's dogs breaking out. So he, knowing I'm an army veteran, gives me this old H and R and 38 Smith and Wesson with <laughs> this old beater leather holster wrapped in electrical tape to keep it together. The handles are wrapped in electrical tape and has like three <laughs> cartridges across the front. I pulled the thing out, looked down the barrel, and I swear to God, you hold it up to the light, you couldn't see an inch of rifling in that damn thing. <laughs> That's how you use it, like two feet, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's already pre- it's already pre tumbling. Thirty eight Smith and Wesson. It needs every- all the help it can get. <laughs> Gray Pilgrim has some Ted Williams, but I was just going to throw in there: if you ever see a J.C. Higgins Model 20 12 gauge shotgun, pick that dude up because it's just a high standard flight king. And yeah. those are some of the best guns out there, and they're cheap. Also, those Steven single shots, they used to be sold under uh, the J.C. Higgins name, too. Single shots in 12, 10, uh, 20. Any Steven shotgun that's single shot is instantly worth it if you can find it in a pawn shop and it's in decent shape because it's a great starter gun for any little kid. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yep. Started off on a Steven C- 94C410 myself. Uh, Gray Pilgrim said, currently I have a single shot Hancock bolt Stevens sincere's bought at a pawn shop for like twenty dollars in the nineteen sixties. Hey that's pretty good. Uh hey Franklin Horse just got a Stevens 520 takedown in a 38 Smith and Wesson number two with the spur trigger at auction. Man Ethan you and him got the same baby gun. Russian the old baby Russian uh uh, Barass said one of those Lebanese military guys fighting on the Syrian army side had a Sig four or Sig five forty. It's like I'll just tell you this with them militias. It's like Call of Duty. Like they have, if there was ever a gun, they probably have it. Probably I, a I'm Camel really gun or two in there too. <laughs> I'm really surprised. Martini Henry, Martini Henry out there fighting. No, I'm really surprised I didn't see any black powder guns. But if Aww. World War Two. Uh, Mausers, Mausers were pretty hot item, evidently at some point, because there's quite a few of them still floating around. The Turkish Mausers, especially. Oh yeah, because so, they it's. Um, I think TFB made a video about that where they discuss in Dara. It still has this kind of mythical status. The Mausers yeah. being what was used to yeah. fight against the Dom, mm-hmm. and yeah. it was seen as this prestige, like precision sniper rifle, and. Yeah, like I said, they've just got such wild taste over there like you did, too. Uh, It's just, like I said, I kind of expected stories from my friends where they were saying, you know, we saw this, like, A-gauge punt gun strapped in the back of a Toyota Hilux (laughs) that was being used as anti-aircraft fire. 
Yeah. Yeah. Everything yeah. everything Black Powder said he started with a Steven single shot four ten. So what did you do? Load her up with homemade black powder and fishing weights and <laughs> I could just see him doing that. <laughs> uh speaking of Garrett. What you got there? This oh, is yeah, a you got black... some... Go ahead. This is a black powder seventy two uh seventy or seventy two caliber pumpkin ball black powder yep. load. Yeah, hmm. Caleb's new favorite load. They work good, surprisingly. I mean, they work really good. Yeah, I had a relative who used to work at a satellite array for like a broadcasting company, and they mm-hmm. use these like big steel ball bearings that are like 70, 72 caliber. So mm-hmm. I have a bunch of those shells that I just cut the top off, poured out the buckshot, and loaded in the pumpkin ball. There you go. And you could probably, at 70, you might get away with it doing that in a, what you shoot, in a modified choke? Yeah. Yeah, because I was going to say, because 69s are just slightly loose in a modified choke. So yeah. 70 would be about perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Everything Black Potter said, you know it. Uh, Brass is still on this subject. He said, seen an old guy in Yemen uh, on the Yemen. Houthi side, whatever. He had some some type of Mauser that had an SVD scope on the side of it. Nice. Yeah, well, it would be not unusual when you see stins that are like gold plated in Syria, <laughs> and then have a Sorry. hollow site welded to the top. <laughs> yeah, another. There you go. Yeah, there's another one I saw one time. I had to do a search on a guy and took his weapon from him, and it was a Type One AK with a 75 yeah. round drum on it. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually forced come across quite a bit of those when I was in Iraq. Several yeah. early Russian AKs. Yep. Yeah, I saw even that. The, was... the real actual Dragon Off sniper rifle. I actually had three of them in my room, and I was wanting to. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to take that thing home so bad, but they wouldn't let us ship them home. I wanted to take my M14 EBR that I found home with me so bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a nice. I didn't rifle. mind the EBR, but it was probably I prefer the 240 Bravo personally when I was in. Yeah, I like the I like the EBR. We used to take chew cans and we'd throw them out there at the on the berm outside the cop and we'd set up in the towers and plank them. Fun times. Yeah. So uh, hey, how question you for you guys. Water, how you doing, Duke? Are you making holsters over there? <laughs> uh I probably should be, but. <laughs> oh, I yeah. got my book. I got my Doug Duke book today. Oh, okay. I've had mine for a while. That is an awesome piece. Uh, Angelica, did you bring me that book? I'll show that off here in a minute. But uh, Yeah, I've been meaning to do a video on it, but, you know, with the laptop dead, it's kind of hard to do. <laughs> do I'll videos. show it off. Hey, uh, I don't Garrett. intend to review it until we get done. But, yeah, guys, <laughs> here you go. Big old book by Doug Dukes, who has been one of our subscribers. He's just one of a common guy, you know, and he wrote, he has a lot of knowledge. Wrote a book, Firearms of the Texas Rangers, from the frontier era to the modern age. And he signed this one for us and sent it to us, I think, to review. And if he's out there, I sure do appreciate it. And uh, he's been watching Duke's channel for a long time and ours, and he wrote a book. Yeah. I'm one of those guys where I just can't get enough books. Uh, I think that was pretty well established last night too, when we were talking, I mean, just look at the background behind me, yep. but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I got John Taffin's 45 and 44 caliber books. So I've got to work my way through those before I pick anything else up. Yeah. Is, is that book for sale? Do you know, Duke? Um, uh, I'm not sure. Um, he never gave me the specifics. I'm not sure where it's listed. I don't remember seeing it on Amazon or, uh, Oh, we lost snapper. Um, uh, to be, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where he, or where or how he sells it. Yeah, I know the Gray Pilgrims out there. This is going to be something he's going to be interested in because he loves books. But yeah, we got pictures of shootouts and guns and ammo and all kinds of good stuff in there. I got to read it before I can review it, but that is a really nice book. Um, we lost Snapper, did he? Yep, he disappeared. All right. So anyway, that we needed that. Uh, how's the holster business, Duke? Um, it's been going good. Trying to get caught up here on it. Um, I've got 
orders finally caught up that were placed from back in December. Uh, I think I got two here. I got to mail out yet, but, uh, yeah. And I got to order leather to get the next batch going here, but, uh, uh, progress is going good. Um, I got, uh, Caleb's Patterson holster tooled. Um, I just got to get out and diet. I just didn't do any dying today because the wind here today is going like 60 miles an hour. Oh boy, it'll be doing still that. Still going. Yeah, it's like I got to open the garage up to get a little ventilation when I'm running the air compressors when I spray the dye on. So I was like, I'm not going to open the garage today. Everything will be out on the highway. You're kind of like so, our, uh, you're kind of our best weather channel because usually what you're getting, we get about three days later, but we get it warmer. <laughs> you're right. So well, you guys got some moisture the day after we did or the same day that we did, oh, so. Yeah. It rained and rained and rained. I'm going to start taking this brown. We got apart. two inches of real dry snow. Yeah. What holster were you making the other day uh, when you were doing your live chat? Or were you uh, making a holster? I think that was the Patterson one. Yeah. Let me go over here and grab that. Just saw you hammering away at it. And it's like, oh, it's like. Watching the blacksmith, except for he's working on leather. So, yeah, I was working on the tooling. Oh, is that Caleb's? That's Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a gorgeous piece. There's one screw up because I can never take and do a basket weave around my maker's mark and get it to line up on the other side. Um, so there's one little screw up up at the top, but I think I got it where it's camouflaged enough. You can't notice it very well. Yeah, that's, that's all it counts. <laughs> but yeah, I just got to get the die on it and then I got to sew the belt loop and yep. stitch together. And this time I know it'll fit the Patterson. I, I oversized nothing. it a little bit. And then this yeah. is the other one you guys got coming. This is a fancy one that I made a while back. And that's for that hmm. metropolitan. Oh, wow. it's yeah. For and, metropolitan. Uh, it's, it's set in my uh, bin for uh, over a year because I was too lazy to put a tow plug in. I finally got the tow plug put into it. So. But uh, the reason why I got disheartened with this one is for whatever reason it came out crooked on the body. So, but I think once you get a gun in there, it'll straighten out. Yeah. Uh, Hardy, so, Duke, uh, go ahead. Sorry, I'll read in a minute. So, Duke, do you only do holsters, or do you things like gun belts too? I don't do gun belts just because the amount of leather it requires to order for that. And yeah. uh, I need to get a good stripper to make belts, and I don't have one. And the one that you really need to make good belts costs too much to justify right now. Yeah. I'm but at, at some uh, point in the future, I will have belts. Yeah. What I want to do is I want to get like a cross chest uh, belt that holds like 24, 38 specials and then has a spot for my holster for my little 38 snubby. Oh, okay. Kind of like a bandolier. Yeah. You, you do a shoulder holster now, don't you, Duke? I got a pattern. I'm working on it. It's still in prototype mode. But yep. this is for my 1911. Um, I'm going to grab my 1911 and I can show it. Fit. I'm going to have to make an adjustment because it rides on the mag release. Okay. While you're doing that, I'll read over here. Uh, Brass said he got three shrapnel lead balls uh, from a 75 millimeter artillery shell in a 16 gauge right now. Been waiting for the wind to die down for our days to do the test. The desert next to where I'm staying was shelled with a model 1907 shells. Cool. And See, I'm go ahead. Yeah, I'm probably going to be going and doing a uh, test here at the range too. Give me one sec. Okay. Yeah, this is that shoulder holster with that 1911 prototype model. Hey, can you guys hear me? Right. Huh? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, Snapper. Okay, Pretty good. Yeah, it felt like I was really um, delayed. Apparently, my wife told me when she, because she's watching the stream, said I was really delayed behind everybody. So I didn't notice Sorry it about on that. mine. Yeah, I didn't so, notice it through here. Okay, well, at least we're all good to go now. So thanks, Ben. Yeah. Uh, Hardy Hat, Hardy Hat said, any old Western movie shows movies that get guns right. The early seasons of Bonanza seem to actually put forth some effort. A little bit really more effort like than is, usual. Uh, <laughs> the one that I really like is Hell on Wheels. Hell on Wheels seemed to put a lot of effort into getting the fact that most of the weapons were either rimfire or black powder, like muzzle loaders. For example, the shotgun Elam Ferguson carries is an old cap and ball, uh, uh, 
muzzle loading double barrel shotgun. He also carries, I think, a Richardson conversion Colt uh, open frame. But yep. they do goof up in <laughs> using center yeah. fire cartridges, but that's just because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you can't exactly get rim fire blanks nowadays for 44 yeah. Henry. Yeah, well, well, they also made the Griswold and Gunnison a beautiful 1860 the, Army. A brass frame 1860 Army for Griswold and Gunnison. So I'll, I'll give Hell on Wheels credit. After season one, if you watch the behind the scenes when they're talking with the armorer, on season one, that guy doesn't know his belly button from a hole oh, on the ground. Yeah. yeah. What was it he was saying about the blunderbuss, Garrett? Uh, the blunderbuss <laughs> was the cannon. Of, the blunderbuss was the 1880s. Something. I don't know. He was talking about the blunderbuss in the 1880s. He, how, he's talking yeah. about the British. That was a standard sidearm for the British in the 1880s. And yeah. it's a CBA <laughs> cap lock blunderbuss. Yeah. <laughs> but be that as it may, like I said, it seemed for they were trying at least whereas yeah. most other westerns you would yeah. expect them to be using things like you know 1860s uh just generic revolvers or they would yeah. be using actual yeah. uh cult peacemakers despite it taking place in the late 1860s early yeah. 1870s and but, i love that long barrel mean, shotgun that they actually use a long barrel shotgun in a lot of it but right yeah I, I give them credit for at least going out on a limb and saying the term Griswold and Gunnison. You know, yeah. things yeah, like right. that. Yeah. But at if you want to put me. movies in order of, of the accuracy of guns, it's Josie Wales followed by um, uh, Unforgiven. Yeah, I was about to say Unforgiven has probably got to be one of the most accurate uh, firearm movies I've ever seen. Like, the fact that the Star Revolver uh, <laughs> is actually in there, that's one of the only on-screen appearances of a star i've seen right uh same thing with like the 10 gauge that will uh bill muncie i think was his character clint eastwood's name bill money will will money. Bill money. money yeah so the fact that he uses a 10 gauge or the spencer which it's shown it's accurate but it wasn't the most accurate of firearms mm-hmm. well i would have to say that if in josie wells my life would be complete if I knew that there was a Confederate walking around with two walkers during the Civil yeah. War. <laughs> yeah, a pair of walkers. Exactly. That that would that would that would make awesome. my day. That would make my life. That'd be amazing. See, I would actually prefer seeing some photographic evidence of a Confederate uh, officer walking around with just two a pair, a brace of Lamat revolvers, one on each hip, like a gunslinger. Yeah. See, I was thinking today. I was thinking today, we ever do a Lamat video, we should get Garrett one of them Confederate hats with a big old feather on it and get him <laughs> his big old gray coat. He's got that beard just right. He could be Jeb Stewart. <laughs> he could. He definitely more of a could. long street. More of a long street. But uh, I was just going to say, <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite old movies that gets it right, I'll give you two examples. Uh, Jimmy Stewart, Shenandoah, completely wrong. All of them are, they get 94... Early in the war, they all got 94 Winchesters that they just take the forehand off of, which everybody did back yep. then. But one that gets it really right, surprisingly, is Shane, especially yeah. when Stonewall draws on uh, Wilson. If you look really close for years, I thought he was using a cap and ball revolver until I mm-hmm. got a good high definition TV and zoomed in. And that was a 72 open top with the sight front on the barrel. Mm-hmm. And in 1950, what two for them to have that? That had to be an original. It had to be an original. So, yep. Yeah, I always thought that was very yeah, cool. I Man, mean, could you the, imagine such a rare gun being in, like actually in a movie? Well, yeah, be- a few dollars more. A few dollars more had an actual volcanic rifle, like a rocket ball rifle, in the final scene. And given it was in the 1960s, wasn't hardly yeah. anyone making reproductions. And you could tell it was an actual volcanic because of how tiny the lever was. It wasn't a Henry reproduction. Yeah, and they're small. Like if you've ever seen a volcanic and like person, they're quite smaller yeah. than you would think. You couldn't like use a, say a you know a Winchester or whatever to re- like make one. It would be too big. So you'd have to make the whole thing from scratch. Or it would be an original. But oh. a few dollars more was another one of those movies that just their firearm choice for the old west was fascinating. I mean Lee Van Cleef's arsenal, where he's got that basically <laughs> bunt line special Colt that's cap and ball all those different uh, weapons he's got on his horse. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, that was, movie was nothing yeah. more than an advertisement ploy for you, Bertie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, it worked. You know, the only thing I have against <laughs> it is of all those guns, the man with no name gun, with the snake grips, that, that gun showed up everywhere now when you type in conversion. That's all you see. And it's like, it's not quite correct, but okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, the only reason that appeared in the Man with No Name trilogy, because I think that was the gun Clint Eastwood used on Rawhide. Oh, it was? I didn't hmm. know that. Yeah. It like I, I think it was the actual huh. that'd be cool. I have this bad problem now of pausing every time I'm watching any old Western and trying to figure out if it's an original cult or not. <laughs> like a normal two hour movie lasts like six hours. Cause I'm just sitting there studying the freaking screen. Yeah. You ever done that with the original with John Wayne. You'd be amazed how many, especially like earlier. Well, even through the fifties and sixties, how many, uh, the majority of those single action armies are cults. Yeah. That's uh, like I said, with the original True Grit with John Wayne in the final scene where it's Robert Robert Duvall and John Wayne charging at each other. Most yeah. of the cult single action armies you see on screen are actually cult new model armies with a yeah. faux ejector rod f- like welded onto the barrel. Yeah, that sucks. They did that a lot. But, That's another. They actually did that in Shane too. If you slow it down at the last yeah. gunfight, uh, where uh, Alan Ladd is shooting with both eyes closed the whole time. If you slow it down and he's shooting all over the place, but he actually has a new service double action there. That's the only way he could shoot that fast. Uh, I liked uh, about Shane. That movie Ombre, they about, do that too. Yeah. What I liked about Shane was the sound effects. How yes. they actually went and took 357 Magnum, shoved it in a trash can and recorded it, and fired <laughs> live 357 Magnum in a trash can to get the sound. Right, that was, oh, yeah, that was great. Uh, Brass yeah. seven six two says that there was a Merwin and Holbert in Bone Tomahawk. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. we were talking about that last night of yeah. Merwin and Holbert's, and that's actually the only on screen appearance of a Merwin and Holbert, just because I think the ammo for it was uh like only to the Merwin and Holbert's, like forty four. It was kind of like the old uh, when Roland White still had the pattern for the bowl, uh, patent for the board through cylinder. And they exclusively made their own types of ammunition to try and circumvent that patent. So with they, Merwin they and Holbert, did. they did make forty-four Merwin Holbert, but almost all of them you find a dare in forty-four forty. So yeah, and there's one in the movie Diablo with Clint Eastwood's son. I can't remember his name, but it's uh, yeah. new one. Scott Eastwood. Not- yeah, there's a Merwin Holbert in that. Don't tell any of my so cool. but I really believe the Merwin and Holbert was the very best. Revolver you could buy. Yeah, absolutely. Don't yeah. tell my I 100% so. agree. I wish you birdie would make a I copy of it. Caleb. I hope you're listening, Caleb. <laughs> yeah, Caleb, I hope you're listening. <laughs> you ruined all of our chances to shoot a Merwin Holbert. <laughs> but, oh, um, oh, how dare Caleb buy that uh, Rogers and Spencer. <laughs> yeah, I know. Merwin Holbert. <laughs> Merwin Holbert. <laughs> Shame. I love how we're all discussing Shame. the accuracy of. Uh, I love how we're all discussing the accuracy of Western movies and their firearms, and no one's brought up Quigley Down Under. Oh, uh, we don't talk about that. <laughs> I, I think it's been so. I think that one is so accurate that it's over. You know, everybody talks about it so much we don't even think about it anymore. Oh yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. I could definitely make that shot with a. Was it a forty-five one ten? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're actually shooting a 4477, but <laughs> yeah, I don't remember exactly. His was a 45 110. Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is, Wyoming was not a state. And yeah, that's yeah, it, it, supposed to take place things. like in the Civil War. Yeah. Okay. What, what, and then what you those those things. I, I have to give it to the rancher guy though. He had a good taste in firearms though. Even yeah. though he's a bad well, dude, like he had a good taste in firearms. See the Crossfire reason I kind of like Crossfire Trail. Yeah. That so one wasn't that bad. He, no, yeah, and then the, um, the bad guy had that Remington. Uh, what was it? The Keen. Yep. Well, that was yeah. in uh, that was in Sons of Katie Elder. It might have been in and Joe Kid. No, yeah, it, it's in. Um, he has it in uh, 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 Crossfire Trail because he shoots the kid with it. Wolf Bromley had a. Evans. Did, did he Evans have a rifle. he had a revolving rifle? 
No, no he had an Evans. Had well, yeah, yeah, Evans did have a re- revolving uh, magazine, but it was an Evans, yeah. But I just like that 1886, I think it was an 86, in 4560, it'll blow you clean out of your boots. <laughs> well, that's, no, it was a 76. No, I, like I think yeah, Joe Kidd 76? is another one that I uh, – Joe Kidd has got to have some of the most interesting choices for a Western uh, for firearms to me because yeah. it's like, the C ninety six, the Savage ninety nine, um, the We're Remington about C96s King. Anymore. <laughs> oh. so, so we don't talk yeah. about them C ninety sixes anymore. They broke my heart. Yeah, all you gotta do is follow <laughs> that link I sent you, and you can get the barrel sleeved, and it'll be good again. <laughs> yeah. If you're let's not broken hearted the- about it, send it to me. We're, we're, let's get some of the these list. comments in. Abraham the Lincoln versus Zombies is the worst one. <laughs> uh, Greg Pilgrim oh, said, Judy Wells had the lightest walkers I have ever seen. Uh, mm, yeah. Everything Black Powder saying, definitely Josie Wells. Yeah. Uh, Greg Pilgrim said he has a Lamat, uh, the mechanic. And we're rolling down through here, guys. If I miss you, I'm sorry. We fell a little behind. Uh, he said, there's a, yeah, Merwin Holbert and Bone Tomahawk. Uh, Great Pilgrim said, I missed the Western era. I am 69 and absolutely the Lone Ranger, Roy Rogers, and all the rest fanatic in costume with cap guns. Yep. From the yeah. old days. Uh, Garza said, what's wrong with Quigley Down Under? Nothing's wrong with Quigley <laughs> Down Under. It's just so good we don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brass says there needs to be more Bulldog-type revolvers and Westerns. Very true. I think he's very right. true. Yeah, I that's where I can think of one. Well. I can That's think of two really. Tombstone, I believe they have one. All uh, big nose Kate. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So that's three. Um, in that TV show, uh, Son of the Morning Star, Custer, they do have him with uh, that bulldog. And uh, right. the new Magnificent Seven movie, they have a bulldog in it. They also yeah, have I one. I think in Deadwood that gets Tombstone. bought for. Uh, God, I can't remember her name, but in like the first three episodes, there's the soiled dove that shoots a guy in the head and he survives it somehow for a few minutes and they confiscate her pistol. So she has this uh, maid go and buy her a new one and it's a bulldog, but it also switches between that, a Remington over under Derringer and a pocket safety for Smith and Wesson in between (laughs) shots. Like, make up your mind. Which one do you want? Yeah, Yeah. I think there's four different ones in that one. Yeah. That's another uh, interesting one. Pac, uh, before you get started, Garrett, uh, Safety Hammerless, the Smith & Wesson New Departure, mm-hmm. it was featured in the shootest. I mean, it wasn't featured, but it was. there was one in the shootest. It was a six-inch oh. barreled one, and old, uh, old guy that ran the Pharaoh tables, what's his name? Yeah. Hugh, uh, Hugh O'Brien? Hugh, Hugh O'Brien, O'Brien yeah. Yeah, yeah he, he makes that. 50 yard shot with that 38 Smith and Wesson safety hammer. 80 feet, 80 feet right through the heart. That was the feet. biggest old West saloon that ever existed, I think. 80 uh, feet. That was, biggest, you know, that was one the of the biggest shootest, safety hammers I've ever seen. The Shootus has got to be one of the goofiest movies I've ever seen when it comes to firearms used. I mean, like talking about John Wayne's personal revolvers that are basically reproduction uh, cold single action armies. But American it's still got to be probably my. Yeah, it's got to be my favorite John Wayne movie of all time just because of the character he plays. I kind of agree. It's like been a one of those things I wish could happen in life where you could go back and meet some of these people. And then in that movie, it kind of makes it so you, you know, like follow that, that story arc where you could meet a like, real gunslinger past the prime kind of thing. I heard well, that, that uh, Hugh, Hugh O'Brien, oh, Richard talking. Moon, all those guys did that for free because they knew it was going to be John Wayne's last movie and they wanted to be in on it. Or they assume yeah, I mean, the only reason Jimmy Stewart went in for the doctor role was because he knew that John Wayne was basically on the way out and they hadn't worked together. And I think almost 18 years by that point. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. There's, uh, a copy that, uh, there's a copy of those uh, single action armies that came from uh, the Colt custom shop. There's one that was on Gunbroker, but it was crazy expensive. Now, That'd be I've kind read of cool I've read that John Wayne dyed those grips himself because they tea bag, the, yeah, and he did it at tea bags to age the ivory. That's, That's why they're more orange than they are yellow. 
Mm -hmm. In that in that particular movie, anyway. So speaking of single action army reproductions, you guys want to hear a funny story? Sure. Sure. So when I was first back from the army, this was when I was going to be discussing earlier. Um, I was at the range doing uh, shooting and this, the black suburbans I was talking about came rolling up. They get out and it's this like party of 40 people from Nevada come to visit family in California. They start unloading all this different stuff, AKs, ARs, lever actions, Rugers galore, blah, 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 blah. And one of the women pulls out this like 12 inch long barreled, uh, uh, Heritage Rough Rider and 22 Magnum. Nice. She loads it up, takes it off to the range, starts shooting, and after five shots, there's a click. Dud. She turns it around, holds it by the barrel, and looks oh, down, no. wondering why it isn't shooting. I automatically go over to the guy who seems to be running everything and is in charge and point it out to him, and he reams her a new one. Not even 15 minutes later, another girl pulls a, like, you guys know those little tiny Caltech purse pistols, the 380s? Yeah. She yeah. pulls one of those out, goes to the range, and just starts unloading. Keep in mind, this isn't something where she doesn't know. This is something she carries on her every day. She shoots, same as the last person, clicks, clicks, doesn't shoot, but because the Caltechs don't have a slide hold open, she starts looking around, finger on the trigger, flagging everyone, and I hit the dirt because she's just flagging everyone with a pistol that looks to be loaded. You said they were they, they were from Nevada. Yeah, that doesn't shock me at all. Yeah, <laughs> no. doesn't shock me at all. Matter of fact, they're kind of on that that evolution where there won't be very many Nevadians left. We're, they're taking themselves out. Well, yeah, I mean, just look at Lake Mead. Pretty sure they're they're not going to have any water in like ten years. Yep. Uh, we'll all be dead. Six, Brass seven six two said, uh, "Last of the Mo Hickens." That's what I call it. Last of the Mo Hickens. Last of the Mo Hickens was pretty good. Uh, sort of a western. Yeah. Depend. I watched. Was, the, uh, are you talking about the new one or the old one? Because the new one has all the Indians in what's basically was it French the and Indian one, War. And the they're all armed has that, all great guns. The new one has that scene where they're uh, he's running and loading that uh, that little rifle. That was a that that's kind of a feat. <laughs> yeah, one of you guys like, need to do guy the test do of still giving you an extra forty yards or whatever it is. What's that? Yeah. What do you need to do the test of silk giving you an extra forty yards? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't. Uh, about that. I'm, okay. So about that. I'm planning on doing a video here before too long, but I'm waiting on a bullet mold to get here. Uh, yeah. Another accuracy test, but I'm planning on doing patch ball, smooth bore, patch ball versus paper cartridge versus wadding on top. See which mm -hmm. one is actually better. Hmm. That'd be interesting. That would be interesting. I just bought a whole lot I of just paper gonna cartridge make paper. <laughs> Make a quick announcement, guys. Doug Duke's book is out on Amazon right now. Okay. Uh, awesome. I believe it's, it's $44 or something for a hardcover, which is not bad for a history hardcover like that. No. Uh, and guys, go check that out. He's he's one of a uh, Duke's subscriber for a long time, been our subscriber for a long time. So let's 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 support the family here. <laughs> I believe Gray Pilgrim said he just ordered it. So very good. Uh, let's go through a few more of these comments. Uh, 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 Quigley rocks. Uh, Gray Pilgrim said, uh, Hardy Hat had one here. He said, I never figured out when Quigley down under was supposed to take place. Was the sharps really experimental by then? Uh, it takes place, I think, sometime in like the 1870s to the 1880s. It doesn't really specify, but based on the fact that everyone in Quigley down under is still using cap and ball revolvers and muzzle loading single shots it's not unreasonable to think it would be relatively soon after the U S civil war. Um, especially thinking. in Australia. Well, I was thinking lady. Thinking, it, it, in your head, Cannon, this has to be after 1874 for him to have that gun, but yeah. no, also, no 69. Yeah. Or is it 69 for the 45 110? Yeah. The sharps 1874 that we've got with the label 74 today is pretty close to the uh, 69. 69, right. I said 79, 69. 
But in the movie saying that he had experimental ammunition, he could be the very first person ever with the 45 110. Well, that's where we put it in 69 to 70. Okay. Yeah. But it could also be the fact that they don't really have, if you look, everyone there with the exception of a couple of characters is using cap and ball revolvers or muzzle loaders. So it could it be pretty much the first center fire uh, rifle that they have. Yeah, uh, we also have had this discussion with uh, Trooper Cody and Steve from Australia, and we had a, a pr some really in depth late uh, Australian Western history. And what he discovered was almost everybody carried cap and ball there until semi auto because that's just all they could get their hands on down there for a lot of people. So that and does. It's, uh, it's probably the same it, principle as the mountain men where they even into the, like the 1870s, 1880s were still using flint locks because it was easier yep. to resupply flint locks than cap locks. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. well, by the time you get in the 1840s, uh, flint locks are making their way out out here in the mountain areas. Yeah. Um, still traded to the Indians heavily, but most of your mountaineers, they've gone to cap locks at that point. Yeah. The 1850s anyway. What yeah. I found out was interesting was uh, the amount of flintlocks that made it into the Civil War at the. I was actually reading about that today. Uh, made it oh. into the Civil War at the beginning of the war, uh, especially the 1816 Springfields. Yeah, I did uh, see an interesting comment here from a Stephen um, Stephen M about the Centennial miniseries. I actually own that on DVD. And I think it's one of the best miniseries you can get for like spanning American history. It's not extremely accurate but it is one of the best representations of the evolution of american history in the west to me i really enjoy that miniseries and it's based off of actual events actual people um that was out here in the west they used fence fort down there in colorado of course that was the first you know reproduction fur trade era fort that had been reproduced so it was two years old when they went in and used that uh, but the Fort John Conference, that is what took place up here at Fort Laramie in 1851. By that time, it was Fort Laramie. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it's it's based off of actual things and actual people. Yeah. And like I said, I absolutely love the miniseries. I own it on DVD. I'm kind of sad they haven't put it out on Blu-ray yet. I also have the book and audio book that I've read and listened to. It's just one of my favorite pieces of media just because it's – I grew up watching that also with my grandfather because he had it on VHS right <laughs> uh everything black powder commented said the only time he's ever been shot at was by a range safety officer at an indoor range because <laughs> that sounds like an interesting story <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh ipod walker said has anyone ever tried silk like from the last of mohicans i think Dulles tried did Dulles try it no no I know he tried leather. because the first thing that's going to happen is when that gun goes off, that silk is going to melt like plastic and stick to the barrel. And it's not thick enough. That's to... okay. I'll give it a try. I'll use Caleb's <laughs> musket. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll use See, this brown of... vest we're taking apart right now. Well, <laughs> your silk what doesn't melt like plastic, does it? Uh, it does I melt. Yeah. I think, I think it melts, melt, but I don't know if it'll. I don't know if it'll stick. stick. I'll, I'll try that. It's gonna, I'm it's gonna burn up the back. You're not gonna see like nylon, but real still is made more like a. It's a fabric of you know. I don't right. know. I've never, silkworm but see like my silk scarves that i get that are actual i've got one that is actual silk you uh -huh. don't ever want to put it through the dryer yeah. uh because it, it just shrinks right. right up and, and and it will melt on high heat yeah you know uh, that could be we have silk pillowcases and stuff my wife washes them in these little baggies and then dries them out everywhere but yeah she doesn't put them in the the dryer or anything well, so yeah that's tell that you what sense. i'll i think i'll add that to that test patching with silk because that's that whole thing. Oh, I can get it. <laughs> I think you can get it. Uh, they got real silk on Etsy, I believe. Uh, yeah. I mean, Duke's got a Duke's got a scarf. We'll just steal that from him. Yeah. No, no my <laughs> real <laughs> silk scarf. I paid pretty penny for. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, real uh, silk is expensive. When it I comes think I paid fifty dollars for it. Yeah. Well, that's almost. And then my other silk ivory. Oh yeah. Uh, my other silk scarves are that are nylon silk. I only paid twenty bucks a piece for them, but 
Yeah. Hardy Hat's got a question here. I think it's probably going to be best answered by uh, Duke, but if any of you else, you can, you can too. But wants to know what do you think of the Buffalo Harvest by Frank Mayer? I have not read that one yet. I think I have that one somewhere. Um, I haven't read the it. thing of it is, is most of my book collections back in Colorado. So all I've got is this box behind me here, full and over the top, and then I've got another box up at the top of the stairs that's full, and then I got a about half that many laying around the apartment here. You know what and I'm that's just the stuff for Fort Laramie. Yeah. I've seen so many people do <laughs> videos on history of firearms from what they find on the internet. And uh -huh. there's so very little on the internet. It, I was guilty of that once. <laughs> yeah, yeah we all I've done were. that a time or two before. I've seen so many people say, oh, no, you don't know what you're talking about because blah, 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 forum. And it's like, really? <laughs> Forums like, today are just um, echo chambers of people saying yeah. the same thing over and over again. Yep. That's. Well, I think the forums are still probably a more reliable source of information than R.L. Wilson, but let's not get down that rabbit hole. <laughs> oh, he's starting it now. What's oh, sad is a lot of the information in the forums is R.L. Wilson. From R.L. Wilson. Yeah, that's the truth, too. That Most of his face comes from him. And you know, can't that blame is. people for it, but, you know, and then they get all mad when you try to tell them anything different, but, you know. Yeah, that's the hardest part. Order. They just don't want to listen. <laughs> uh, we have a few here. Uh, Constitutional Carpenter's in. Hello. He said, my family had their flintlock upgraded to a cap sometime in the 1800s. I thought yeah, Walker said silk should burn. Uh, uh, ba -ba -ba. Everything Black Powder said, use Duke's silk underwear. <laughs> I, I, I think it would be a little too thin. Uh, uh, Franklin Horse said, I ordered a revolving rifle in 357 from Taylor's almost 11 months ago. Still haven't heard from him. Uh, I'm not, not to throw anybody under the bus, but that's been our experience with Taylor's too, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, I've I've ordered from a, uh, what did I? I ordered that part for that Schofield from Taylor's at hand. Remember that? Mm -hmm. uh, ended up sending me the wrong part, so I just went and stretched the hand out. Uh, we ordered a second. Uh, we ordered a Walker uh, bolt. Back and this was when we couldn't get one and no nothing was in, so we waited and waited and waited like eleven months for it. And the guy called my brother Caleb. He was working in a ditch, and he said, "We got this part for you." And Caleb said, "I gotta walk up the ditch. Take me a couple minutes. Grab my wallet out of the truck." And the guy said, "Oh, we can't wait that long. We're gonna sell it to the next guy." <laughs> and they did. And that has been our experience with Taylor's. Just not to throw anybody on the bus. Maybe it's not like that all the time, but that's what we've had happen. Speaking of that, I, I need to find a bolt for that Army San Marco walker. That's it's actually hard to find an Army San Marco bolt. Yeah, Army San See, Marco parts are hard to find. Good luck finding an Army San Marco anything. Yeah, uh, VTI is your best bet, and I think got it. Nobody does. Wings <laughs> have something to say here. Yeah, but speaking of tailors, I'm. I've not ordered anything from them yet, but everything I saw on the internet, it's kind of like uh, this website I've ordered from recently called Buy My Mags. I ordered a couple of Mini 14 mags like two months ago, and they still are stuck in shipping status, like waiting to be picked up. But with Taylor's, that's a, what I've seen across the internet is basically the consensus is they take forever. They have very poor response times. But God dang, if they don't have some of the most gorgeous looking reproductions on their website. They do. See, yeah. I used to... Um, I don't know if the same parts guys there or not, but back when I ordered parts from Taylor's, I just call him up and do the order right there. And they always treated me pretty good. I always got things reasonably quick, uh, with the exception of that eight inch barrel from my Richards Mason. It was a year and a half. I waited for that thing. And then they finally called me one day and said, Hey, we need to get you paid up by tomorrow or we got to sell it to the next person. So, and then I paid the premium for it. So I'm guessing what they're doing is they're selling stuff they don't actually have an inventory yet. Well, it was oh, back order. Wow. They had to do a special order for it. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of Royal Tiger Imports. Oh, boy. Oh, Here God. we go. I'm starting them on Royal Tiger, Tiger Imports. But, um, yeah, that's generally my – like what Duke said. Um, I have a similar uh, situation with Ruger where about – 
six months ago, I picked up a Ruger Mini 30 from my local uh, gun store as a two for one sale along with my Mini 14. And when I brought it home, it only had a Pro Mag. So I, at my <laughs> local gun store, pick up like five of these Ruger factory magazines and none of them work. It's basically a single shot rifle where you have to hold the magazine, rack the bolt, hope like three, four times it'll maybe pick up the round. It was to the point where I thought someone had welded the gas port shut on it to make it like a straight pull it. bolt action. Huh. Huh. And so I send the rifle and all my magazines to the factory. They all get hand fitted to the rifle. Turns out the feed lips were bent too far inward. And it's the point where now if I experience any issues with any of my Ruger products or if I need something for warranty services, I call up this tech named Reno who works out of the Connecticut factory. Yeah, that it's uh, I was just reading over here. Uh, I think I lost it, but there was a few. Uh, <laughs> nobody wants to see the Duke underwear show. Silk shoes. <laughs> okay, <gotcha. Aww. laughs> Steven's not up for that show. Uh, uh, I'll give new was... meaning to YouTube shorts. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Dude, uh, dude, dude, tell us what, your, your what you thought dude, YouTube Shorts was supposed to be. <laughs> I was going to do a funny video of that, me walking around my shorts, but I couldn't get brave enough to do it. <laughs> oh, Okay, iPod Walker, Ethan, he's listening, but he's got, one, got an eye on the Patriot movie that's now playing. Oh, yeah? The that Patriot. is a god-awful movie. Oh, let's oh, not go oh, down that The road. guns were beautiful, though. But let's not go down that road. We've uh, we've picked Brandon F. videos apart from top to bottom. And I mean, I we get into hostiles if you want, Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will say this about it, and a lot of people will disagree with me. But there was a Brandon F. had talked about it, and I like I watched some of Brandon F. stuff to learn about 18th century stuff. But he was talking about how a British officer would never commit a war crime like that in the Revolutionary War burning down churches and i was like well oh, tavington is tavington is based off of banister tarleton who if i remember right called uh presbyterian churches especially dens of uh sedition and he yeah. was actually pretty pretty well known for burning down presbyterian churches as well as baptist churches i mean they called him bloody tarleton for a reason i bloody mean I, I can see I can see why some people don't like it, I guess, because it's kind of one sided. But when you look the main at it, thing, the main thing when I you got, look at it, it's supposed to be one sided because you're looking at it from their point of view. I can't That's remember true. what date it was, but they got the wrong date for when Charleston was taken. That's a pretty big oof. Yeah. Uh, they were using modern British uh, United Kingdom flags, which was also a pretty big oof. Uh, and yeah, don't worry about it. But my thing yeah. with the Patriot isn't the one sidedness. It's just it falls into too much jingoism where it's just I'm pro American, but there is a limit where you just hit too much. And Mel Gibson screaming across a battlefield with the colonial flag flowing behind him oh, like he's some awesome. kind of it's great. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful. just the American version of Braveheart. It is true. Yeah. I mean, it's about as close as you get to the American version well, of Braveheart. Well, I'll say here's this. the thing. You, you got to remember, it's taken from their point of view. And if you're at the Battle of the Cowpens yep. and you've yep. been losing for six years straight, and you if you did see a guy running with that flag and you're across the battlefield and rallying and you win, and you got old what's-his-face, old uh, – who's the general, Ethan? Uh, Green. Daniel Warren Green, Wallace. and they're going, charge. <laughs> you know? No, no, that's, that's Daniel Morgan. Daniel, Daniel Morgan. Morgan. Who was known yeah. by – that's that's who uh, – that's actually who Mel Gibson is based off of Daniel Morgan. He's yeah. based off of Francis Marion. And I couldn't remember. There was a third one he was based off of. But they it's, talked his about nickname Daniel. Was like, I think his nickname was the Swamp Fox, but that could be the Francis, other individual. Yeah, Francis Marion. Yeah. Francis Marion oh, yeah. was a Swamp Fox. But okay. uh, Daniel Morgan was actually very well documented by his men of charging across the battlefield at Cal Penn. On horseback. But on different. horseback, but his men had said, and I quote, he bellowed like a bear. So, and you also got to realize, <laughs> so Revolutionary War, 
Uh, a lot of people have said that things like the Patriot and everything have played it up too much. They might have a little bit, but I don't think it's as bad as you think because if you read any of the letters of the time, mm-hmm. people would talk about giving it all for the cause. I will mm-hmm. lay my life down for the cause. And today I was sitting out there. I ran roughly over over 100 rounds to this brown bess of 200 grain charge uh, to Ooh. this brown bess. Yeah, that's – and it's a homemade powder. Garrett's made it to the original 18th century specs, so it's perfectly safe, and it's an accurate load. And I was putting those – head. I put my headphones in, and I put 18th century warfare ambience, cranked it as loud as I could. <laughs> yeah, they have a oh, thing Oh, you were like living that, the dream, just, weren't you? Well, whenever you, I was sitting there, I was thinking about that, and I heard, make ready, present, fire, and then just deafening – Boom, you just hear that that crack. And I was sitting there, I was thinking about that. I was like, could you imagine? Because first of all, American soldiers were not getting paid. They did not get paid for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And they yeah. did it out of what they believed in. So they really did have their heart in what they were doing. And they were, there's not a doubt in my mind that if somebody was out there at the cow pens, and I'm sure several people did it, they they got a little crazy. But just the thought of that, that wall of, they called it the wall of iron, uh, 69 caliber round balls flying down range at 1200 feet per second, just thrashing everything in their path, man, you would have to be really believing in what you're fighting for in order to stand there and take that. And at the same but time, anyhow, fighting the strongest military in history at that moment. And you're just uh, a group of guys. Yep, if they were not the strongest, because the French, there's an argument over whether them or the French were the strongest at that point. But if they were not the strongest, they were... They were close to it. They were close, yeah. and they definitely had the strongest Navy. Don't even get me started it's on the Paul Jones. majority of the world. Yeah, it, it, would, it actually seemed more like a lost cause battle at the beginning, and I'm yep. sure they felt that way, and I think that's why they went all in. Like, I'd rather die than lose. Yeah. Well, that's... And to, uh, and to what Duke said, it's a little bit different, because... Braveheart, I love the show and the sentiment, but oh, the clothing's yeah. wrong, the swords are wrong, the battles are yep. wrong, the names are wrong, the people's wrong. Whereas when, and I know everybody gets into the Patriot and this and that. Hold on, you telling me my kill is correct? The battles are correct. <laughs> the clothing is really, really good. Uh, the guns are correct for the most part. Uh, and like I said, I believe the spirit of the, the, the movie is I believe the, the spirit Patriot is correct. Spirit of the time, and so I think it's right. But uh, a lot more than Braveheart. <laughs> Braveheart's just yeah, out there. <laughs> but, oh, but yeah, it just that's one of the reasons why I got so much into the Revolutionary War. It's just uh, there's something about that. Uh, one more thing before I quit going off my rant here. Uh, one of the stories I liked about was after the Revolutionary War. A lot of people don't talk about it. There was several rebellions and uprisings that happened afterwards. And there was almost a straight up second revolutionary war against the new American government. Mm. And, uh, and it was because the guys hadn't got paid. They couldn't get them paid. And so these guys had literally given everything for what they believed in. And they were ready to fight. And George Washington had walked in there. And I don't know if it was a, a politician's trick or what, but he had been living with his men for a long time. Pulls out a letter. He's yelling at him, telling him they shouldn't be doing this. Pulls out a letter, goes to read it, and he looks down and he says, somebody go get me my glasses. He said, <laughs> not only has this war robbed me of my son of years of my life, it's robbed me of my eyesight. And they said there was not a – of all these men who had spent years fighting this bloody war, they said there was not a dry eye in the house. Because everybody realized he had just lost his son at Yorktown. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought up the fact that Revolutionary War soldiers weren't really assuming you know about uh, Timothy Dexter then? Timothy Dexter. No, I do not know about Timothy Dexter. He was, the keep, he was the keeper of deer in Malden, Massachusetts. The thing is, there was no deer in Massachusetts because they'd all long yep. since to death. Hunted out. And yeah. this guy was a fourth grade dropout that somehow made himself a fortune uh, off of these ridiculous things where he sent shipments of coal to Newcastle, England, which was a coal town. He sent 
like bed warming pans to Jamaica that they used as syrup ladles for molasses and sugar. <laughs> yeah. And one of the ways he made a boat, literally a boatload of money is he bought these revolutionary war chits. I guess you would call them the paper. They paid the soldiers with for literal like half pennies on the dollar to where mm -hmm. he had crates and boats loads of these promissory notes. They paid revolutionary soldiers in. And when the U S government started basically the foundations and promised to buy back all these notes from the soldiers, Timothy yeah. Dexter basically like quadrupled or septupled his payments, like made his money back six times over. Yeah. And so he was one of the first like American millionaires with a fourth grade education. <laughs> wow, You'd be amazed yeah. how many millionaires are out there without even high school education. Yeah, <laughs> everything Black yeah. Powder says beats the anti-American stuff Hollywood cranks out nowadays. That's for sure. Yep. I think we can leave yeah. it at that. Uh, we're talking sure. about a lot of people is uh, if you if you look at who a lot of the rich people in the world are, school doesn't teach you to be rich. It teaches you how to work for somebody else. College yeah. teaches you how to work for somebody else. Yeah. I just saw someone in here, and I don't know who it was. Sorry if I missed your name, but someone said the 69 caliber round ball in the brown vest was more accurate than people think. Stay tuned. Yeah, I'm, I, I have to agree with that <laughs> yeah. statement because one of the things I saw was a video from Enrange TV, Carl, and one of the things he did is he took this old Indian trade musket for the celebrate or in remembrance of Wounded Knee, and he loaded it up and he's shooting at this target a hundred yards and he's landing every shot. And I was just amazed because I was kind of one of those that grew up in the era where muskets were inherently inaccurate. You couldn't yep. place the round at the same place every time, but seeing that video, it's like, I, wow, I don't know how, but maybe that myth just wasn't really all that true. I don't I think tell you true. this, anything within a hundred meters. I uh, well. Anything at 100 meters standing, it's, it's easy. a pretty easy shot with a smooth bore. It really yeah. is. You start to run out of gas at around 200. That's when everything starts getting tricky. And it's mostly Wait, due to the – yeah, and that, yeah, for me. And it's mostly due to I'm shooting things like 75 caliber with 200 grains of powder. And you do that after a while, your barrel starts to heat up, you get heat mirage. Yeah, and you start to flinch after a while because this thing kind of kicks. <laughs> that's like why a when you yeah. said that's why when you said that you shot a hundred rounds of that. I mean, after five rounds of shooting a ninety grain charge out of my Thompson Center Renegade or my Hawken, the barrel yeah. already getting hot at that. Let alone a hundred yeah. rounds. I can't imagine how freaking hot your barrel was getting. It uh, was. I spent twenty. I spent forty eight hours making a pound of powder. Ethan shoots it in thirty shots with two hundred grains a shot. Yeah. <laughs> I, sh I burnt through, uh, well, actually, I burnt through about a, a horn and a half today just trying to get over my flinch of not shooting flintlocks for over a year. You guys should have seen how expensive this was before we get started making our own powder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, I've got something like 30 pounds of Pirate X RS and P sitting in my safe right now, along with all my reloading powder just because it's climate controlled in there. Yeah. yeah, I personally don't like shooting Pyrodex anymore. Since I started the whole real black powder thing and making it myself, I just but don't like shooting Pyrodex. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with it though either. But no, there's nothing wrong with it at all. It's not but... where you live See, is pretty damp, isn't it? Uh, wings? There's not really. No, I live in the it's Mojave. The it's only really. Oh, yeah, yeah. Totally yeah. Damp. I forgot. For some reason, I was thinking it's... Greg Pilgrim. <laughs> well, that's the funny thing is everyone Death has Valley. this. Everyone has this idea, this concept that deserts are inherently dry. That's not really the case. We're still in no. California, and because of that, we have monsoon seasons in the summer, so it does get very damp. No, the issue is the heat. If you put Pyrodex or reloading powder like smokeless powder out in a garage, yeah. and it gets to 118 degrees, then it drops to like 60 at night, that heat fluctuation will just mess Kill with it. your powder in all sorts of different ways. Yeah. But yeah. people were talking about shooting in a flintlock. Guys, he's his uh, what I consider him an expert more in, and I don't know if he considers himself an expert, is the Hawken. Because, and I need to talk to you about this because you have several videos that are fairly detailed on Hawkins and re repo Hawkins. And what got you into that? Is that just when did you start Hawkins? 
So what got me into Hawkins is uh, funny thing. I hated black powder rifles for the longest time. Blasphemy, I know, but I despise them under the sim singular concept that when I was 19 or 20, I was in a pawn shop in a gun store looking at different guns. And one of the guys tried selling me on this. I think it was a Moroku made Kentucky long rifle that weighed something like 12 <laughs> pounds <laughs> and all of the weight was on the front end. So I'm holding this thing, struggling to hold this rifle that's as tall as I am. And it's just horribly off balance. It's cl a cludge of a rifle. It, I just hated the thing. So for the longest time, I refused to shoot black powder. I didn't want to get into muzzle loading. And one day, one of my friends is down at the local gun club, t uh, zeroing his Thompson Center Hawken for uh thompson center maxi balls at 100 yards for deer hunting in wyoming later that year and he asked me if i want to go ahead and yeah it, he asked if i want to go ahead and take a shot with it so i agree sure and i take three shots with the thing at 100 yards and i wind up with a group about that big yeah so that's kind of what got me into the Hawkins and the Renegade that I have was basically just the feather trigger that the hair trigger that was on that thing after you said it, how accurate they are, how mm -hmm. maneuverable they are for a caliber of its size and weight. And so that just kind of is where it naturally evolved for me when it comes to black powder. I'm not a big inline guy. Um, the only thing that I would consider that Steven single shot, I could convert that to an inline muzzle loader fairly easily, mm -hmm. but no, I'm just, I'm more of a traditional side lock kind of guy. Um, flint yeah. locks, not so much just because the thing is in my area, cap locks are already kind of difficult to feed. Mm -hmm. Um, you can still get the powder and the ball for it, but it's getting the caps that are the issue. Same thing with flint locks where flints you can't really get in my area. Um, you can order them yeah. online, but I don't want to be dependent on an online resource for my rifles, basically. Well, I ordered about a crap ton of spare flints from uh, IMA. They came from that yeah. Nepal. Nepal. Uh, I mean, yep. they buy by the pound, and I bought like 15 pounds of flint. So I got like a yeah. lifetime supply of flint for me. And when it comes also, to powder, yes. I just make my own. It's really simple. And it's it's usually legal in every state I know of, as long as you don't yep. make so much of it. Those flints you get from Nepal, I'll tell you this. I'm pretty sure that those Nepalese brown best muskets, they're mm -hmm. third model or the Indian pattern. But I think that they have a larger... Uh, on the cock piece, I think they've got a larger flint holder because if you try to put those in uh, older brown best styles, they're really big. <laughs> really big. They're really well, big. What I do, I do is I, it's not the right way to do it because I was trying to learn how to like nap flint, but I'm really bad mm -hmm. at it. And I didn't want to keep breaking this stuff up. And believe it or not, this there worked perfectly. I bought a Dremel tool with the little diamond bits. And I could carve yep. it into the exact way I'd want. And I've, I've done that several times and it worked perfectly. And, you know, I'd carve I've the been... end. It wouldn't be perfect, but then I would just lightly nap it like you would if you were normally just napping your, your flint over time on the rifle. And I don't nap perfect. flint because my area, we don't have, like I said, flint <laughs> in the ground. It's We have a lot of dry lakes, but oddly no flint where you would normally find it in dry mm -hmm. lakes. So what I learned, because we have a lot of volcanic activity... I learned how to obsidian. nap obsidian. Yep. And, and here's the thing. Obsidian that should work. A flint lock. That should uh, work. A flint lock. Yeah. Straight up working a flint lock. You can, it's actually pretty decent stuff. See it what I use. Is be I, better. Every time I go up to Fort Riley, I'll get a big old core of, they call it hornstone. It's flint, but it's kind of a grayish, yellowish color. Yeah, I know what you're talking and about. I'll, it kind of looks yeah, waxy. I'll Mm -hmm. I'll nap that, and that's pretty decent. But obsidian should work pretty, pretty well. Mm -hmm. I think the only so, problem you might have with it is it might be a little hard. It might be a little fragile. But well, Duke, Duke, uh, where did you, Duke used to be a famous flint breaker? Yeah, <laughs> his first better slowly. Where were you getting your flints at, Duke? Uh, I was buying them off of uh, I think Track of the Wolf. 
Yeah, yeah because Track of the Wolf just, gets English flints, and yeah. from what I understand, they're really good quality. But again, it's kind of I want something that I can get locally, and so that's why I do the cap locks because I can make my own caps flint. I'm kind of limited to having to order stuff through catalogs or online if I want to get a new set. But do you have a striker set? A uh, striker set? For a fire. I was gonna yeah, say, I have a uh, ferro rod. Magnesium? Get, yeah. get you some of that uh, obsidian up there and try and see what kind of spark you get out of it. It'd be interesting. Oh, obsidian's too brittle. Yeah. It it's depends. Very brittle. It can be used, though. Can be, it but can yeah. Be, but I think it's pretty brittle. You want uh, yeah, flint, chalcedony, or quartz, and quartz is almost a little too brittle. Yeah, I've seen some. I've seen some videos. Of some people use some obsidian, but if memory serves me right, I think it was kind of brittle. Yeah, uh, but it and marked really well. <laughs> Somebody... um, you also <laughs> one of the other things I never really did flat uh, flint locks for is just because you always look and like my cap lock. Thompson Center Hawken that I got into was mm -hmm. about three hundred dollars with a mirror bore. I mean, this thing looked like it was straight out of the factory and it just been a wall hanger. Same thing with my Renegade. My Renegade was a mirror bore. Everything's pristine, and that cost me three hundred also. Whereas there a Thompson go. Center Renegade in flintlock is like a eight to nine hundred dollar rifle. Same thing with the Hawken. The Hawken is a little more expensive, up to a thousand sometimes. Uh, is what I've seen them. You can shoot uh, everything. Black Potter said, "Yeah, he said obsidian works in the flintlock, and he, I think he would know." But uh, everybody has their own thing, and I'm just glad you're into these Hawkins because you've even I've read some books on them, and you've even brought up some things like uh, barrel length and weight issues on the Renegade, which I always considered the Renegade pretty good, but I didn't really think about that. But you're right; it needs to be a longer barrel, heavier, a lot heavier. I still like the mm -hmm. Renegade. <laughs> and it's just it's kind of one of those things that it's kind of like the uberti reproductions we have now where they aren't one-to-one -one that's that you have to kind of make the compromise when you're making reproductions between historical accuracy and usability for the modern market because some people will want that 100 percent accuracy but in order to get to a broader market you have to make it to where it's a little bit more maneuverable. It's a little bit lighter. It's something that you can carry around the woods if you want. And also modern manufacturing. Certain stills they can get, certain stills that they don't want to spend a lot of money on versus price per yeah. sell point. And well, a lot of it too is like a lot of the reasons you birdies and Pietas are a little bit different size than originals is because they're a metric. Everything's made in metric there. So they convert yeah. everything from metric to English. It's very close, but it's not exact. I'll say this: yeah. the closest you're gonna get to a Lyman, probably Great Plain. Yeah, but even it, if you look, it's just pockmarked with marks all over it. And um, just like any good old Invest Arms, when you pull that lock off, you're gonna find a coil spring in it. So yeah, you know none well, of them. I don't think there's like anything that. that's perfectly hawking ish yet. Now I'm saying Kibler would probably do it next year, but who knows? Oh my! See, invest I would arms actually the best. Cool. If Go Kibler ahead. made a Hawken that was like perfect, ah, oh, I'd want one of those so bad. Yeah, next thing they're going for is a Fowler. So what but he? Uh, I want to. I want to hear what Wings says. Yeah, he's got something to say. What does he got to say? So when it comes to the Hawkins, a hundred percent accuracy would be interesting, but you also have to remember that the Hawken isn't really a set pattern based on historical oh. records because right. most. You know, you're talking about the era of the custom firearm. And like I was saying last night, that's kind of what pisses me off, if you'll excuse the language, <laughs> about modern firearm manufacturers is Winchester. You could get anything under the sun with their firearms. You could get the same with Remington's. Up until about the 1950s, you ordered from a uh, firearm manufacturer, you could get whatever custom job you wanted. But now everything's you buy from the store. That's what you get. There's no customization. You can't call up a company and say, hey, I want this with this kind of configuration, this stock. You know, you can't call up Rossi and say, hey, I want your Trapper model carbine in 357 Magnum with the rifle length stock because I need a little mm -hmm. longer length of pull. That's just not how it works anymore. And mm -hmm. that's kind of where the Hawken is, is 
even the ones that they have in the Smithsonian, I think they have three examples of original Hawkins from the Hawkins factory in St. Louis, Missouri. And they all three of them while uh, very in little small ways, they all have the same kind of set pattern, but they're all just little differentiations. Yep. Uh, I was just reading here. Gray Wolf said the lineman is perch bellied and no one takes enough wood off of them. And the snail is really bad. Yeah. That's the thing. Uh, I've actually seen people cut that straighter flat line and then they'll come in here and take a lot of wood off the wrist. But what you're doing is you technically, since these aren't made out of ash, you're technically making that uh, wood a little weaker. I don't know if it would be enough to hurt anything, but the old ones were made out of a, a little better quality wood than these Italian ones are made out of. And, uh, mm -hmm. I just, I, I do like this one just because it's not brass fitted, which there were some Hawkins that were brass fitted. But uh, Duke can tell you about, speaking about custom Hawkins, how, well, how much did Tom Tobin's Hawkin weigh? 28 pounds. That's a big pounds. boy Hawkin. <laughs> yeah. That's like an inch and a half across the barrel. Or Can you imagine yeah. carrying that thing around? Holy cow. He made good use of it. Yeah, he did. did yeah. Holy cow. Didn't you tell me that those big heavy barrel ones like that, though, they were using them for pry bars when they got their sharps? Yeah, it was uh, um, Alexander – or not Alexander Hamilton. Um, William Hamilton. Uh, he was uh, a kid that came out in the 1840s from Scotland and trapped around with old Bill Williams for a few years, and then they wound up in the California gold fields. They said when they got to the gold fields, they took their hawk and rifles, had a blacksmith hammer the barrels into crowbars, and then they went and bought sharp uh, breech loader revol or breech loading rifles. There you go. <laughs> that's kind of sad, but <laughs> I guess it worked. That's a lot of iron. yeah. That's bad. Yeah, because they said that the hawk and barrels made the best crowbars for digging gold. <laughs> <laughs> you ever heard of uh, Little Bill's uh, Lucretia Borgia rifle? Who's that? Uh, Buffalo Bill Cody. Um, he had yeah. a single shot trapdoor Springfield that he used to use for all of his hunting purposes. And apparently it was broken by Tsar Alexander of Russia on a hunting trip. <laughs> he called it Lucretia Borgia because it was the most deadly rifle he ever, ever owned. And it's still on display, I think, in the Buffalo Bill Cody Museum in uh, Cody. Uh, in Wyoming? Yeah. <laughs> And on the same czar of like World War One had his family executed, czar, or was that the father? It, uh, the I father. think it the yeah. father. Okay. It was it was, no. it was the czar that came on the big hunting trip that made all of Wild Bill Hickok and Buffalo Bill and all those guys famous. Got yeah, it's czar czar Nicholas. To, it's the czar that came to the United States and Dan Wesson went and had a talk with about getting a new model three made. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's czar trip. Nicholas the third was the one who i can't remember if it was him or franz ferdinand but one of them got a train that went throughout africa put up a bunch of colt 1905 uh potato digger machine guns in an armored carriage and basically just used them to mow down whatever was in their path while they were on this train on a hunting trip that sounds <laughs> like something that that sounds that very sounds Austrian. That sounds <laughs> yeah, very, very Austrian. Austrian. Very Austrian. <laughs> very Austrian and very expensive. Oh, man, I, that's I purposely on hand killed most of the wild animals in this country. The dude looks <laughs> like he's got something to say. No, I was just reading through the comments there. Uh, Todd Bead mm. said it was an 1866 Springfield. Mm. I don't know. Uh, uh, Hardy Hat said also with the factory Kentucky rifles, they are all pretty bulky. Usually, yeah. usual suspects could do well by updating their designs. Just watch, guys. We're talking about Hawkins. Give it five or ten years. Jim Kibler will come out with a Hawkins. It's too lucrative for him to not do it. And I wish he'd he come out with a Northwest Trade gun. He, that oh, might that, be actually really that would be nice. He's coming, he said he's coming out with a Fowler. He and never said not, what kind, but I think he said he it'll said, have trade gun. Uh, it'll be trade gun like. Yep, he did. So it could be a Carolina type G or something too, though. So I don't know. I'm still waiting on the Woods Runner. I did my pre order in July and I'm excited to get her. I bet. I've been wanting to get I need one to myself. get one sixty two so I can go moose hunting with it. 
<laughs> I, you know, I think I was talking to you about this the other day. I've I've shot a lot of these really big bore flintlocks. I kind of want to go to one of them ones that are a little smaller caliber. Oh, the like one of those rockets, the thirty-two. Well, yeah, if Garrett's got thirty-six. I think I'm going to shoot that tomorrow. I got but, yeah, uh, I got thirty-six. Because after shooting the brown best enough, I got her shooting like little brother has that traditions fifty caliber. I shot that fifty caliber. I was like, this feels like I'm shooting a twenty-two. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it is. I don't want to pay that there kind of money points. for a squirrel gun. <laughs> well, yeah, I I, I kind of want it because I want to see how far out I can take it. I want to yeah. see how far that accuracy difference is between it and the smooth bore. Well, here's the thing: most of our hunt, I mean, we hunt some deer, but ninety percent of what we're going to be hunting, you hunt jackrabbits, squirrels, coons, mm-hmm. all that stuff, good for a thirty-six or smaller. Well, and I want to take a coyote hunting too. Uh, yeah, uh, a forty-five caliber. <laughs> I, I yep. was just thinking about everything Black Powder, his video where he was saying people were calling his 45 caliber a squirrel rifle, and he, he had two pictures of two squirrels, and he said the first one he shot and the second one died of sympathy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I mean, 45 caliber, there was nothing. And he shot coyotes and everything else with that 45, so it's a good I small download- game ground. I downloaded that video whenever I uh, pre-ordered that. Yeah. Kibler because where I was working I didn't have any signal and I was watching that and he's like well it's a little bit much for squirrel I was like yeah that's man that thing wow <laughs> man unless you're just making of course, squirrel too of course Caleb still hunts squirrel with thirty out six so you know <laughs> a gray wolf had something bed. there that Duke, Duke might comment on he said people don't pay enough attention to the Lehman the Gimmer and the Derringer planes guns yeah. Yeah, those were pretty common back then. The Lehmans were as common as Northwest trade guns. Uh, they were actually trade rifles. Um, and, you know, they kind of got that. They're really the ones that the modern brass clad Hawking copies are closer to than actual closer to Hawkins. But uh, those are pretty common. Um, I'd love to have one. But the thing with those, they had such a pronounced crescent. I've shot one of those. And if you don't have it in your shoulder, just perfect, it lets you know about it. Um, You you don't shoot a modern stance. You got to shoot across your body because otherwise it doesn't get in your shoulder right. Um, Uh, And they were half stock, full stock, uh, flintlock, cap lock. Um, Derringer rifles, they were really nice, uh, long barreled. Um, they're kind of a Kentucky style. Uh, those are really nice Henry's and this is not the Henry lever action, different Henry. There was a a bunch of uh, Henry rifles at that time that were kind of the higher up of the trade guns, um, just under a Hawken. Those were really common. Uh, and Dickert rifles were common. Yep. He just wrote that also Dickert. mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, if you guys want to see some good videos or a good video on a Lehman trade or a Lehman trade rifle, Go check out Turkey Creek 1823. He yep. handmade yep. one that was like perfect to spec, and it was a beautiful gun, and he shot it really well. Yeah, uh, and Track of the Wolf carries uh, um, kits for those. Um, they've got a Dicker kit. They've got um, a Layman kit. They don't have a Derringer kit. I've seen a copy of a Derringer. Like I said, it's kind of a, a typical Kentucky style. Uh, but the one I seen had a swamp barrel. Oh, it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. Uh, well yeah. balanced, very long barrel on it. Um, yeah. But, iPod uh, Walker said it was the Grand Duke, not the Czar. I think we were all a little yeah. mixed up. Oh, um, Grand Duke sorry, Alexander. Man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a couple of here. Uh, everything said, Black uh, Powder says. Everything Black Powder says. People still call it a squirrel gun. Yeah. You know, that's what I'm, I'm, I might do like black powder maniac and just put like 15 grains in there and uh, see if I can just like knock them out or something. <laughs> your woods runner is coming in 45, isn't it, Ethan? Yep. I went in small as I could get because I kind of want a little, well, something a little bit uh, easier on the shoulder and maybe on the pocketbook too. Well, now it's Wasn't on the he time. Wasn't knocking cause... holes in that, that, was it wood or metal at, with like yep. five grains of That's powder? It was pretty impressive. Yep. For some reason, uh, what was it 15 grains into it? Yeah, uh, Hardy's hat said when you shoot thirty out six to shoot squirrels and you accidentally nail a dog three miles away after it vaporizes the squirrel, 
<laughs> yeah, we can. T- we have a family member who's right there in the room with Ethan who does hunt squirrels with a thirty out six. It's just yeah. thirty caliber, isn't it, Caleb? <laughs> so I don't have it on me right now. But one of the things, sorry about that. Um, since we're talking about squirrel guns, um, one of the books I picked up. Um, I don't know if any of you guys know who he is. Name author's name is Gary Polson. He wrote the book Hatchet. It's kind of standard reading when I was a kid for school. I've um, heard it. I never read it, but I've seen it in the library. Yeah. Um, but I I loved reading his books growing up. And one of the things I picked up, he wrote a book in the '90s, a little short story called The Rifle. And it follows this flintlock Kentucky rifle handmade from the start of the Revolutionary War up until the 1990s. And it's kind of one of those books where you can tell it was written pre-internet era because it's full of those old FUD myths and gun lore, that sort of thing. (laughs) Yep. Um, But in it, he talks about this rifle. And it's one of the most interesting because it actually talks in great detail about how the old rifles used to be hand-forged, handmade, and... The interesting thing about it was he describes this rifle as having curly maple with bird's eye in the stock, like the bird shot pattern. And it's in a 43 or 42 caliber. And Mm -hmm. to me, what was interesting about that is they everyone says, oh, the 45 is a squirrel rifle. But it's it's kind of interesting to me because (laughs) he talks about how this is an impressively accurate rifle. And I've just, I, because the only rifles I've ever shot for black powder are 50, 54 and 56 calibers. So I don't know if like a 42 caliber would be that much more accurate than a 50 caliber potentially because it's a lighter projectile, but I don't really know. It's just something that I always found interesting because it was such an odd caliber to have a black powder rifle in because Mm -hmm. you only hear about them being large bore. Yep. Yeah. Well, forty caliber was actually a very popular caliber because it was kind of that happy ground in between squirrel gun and deer rifle. And that's kind well, of what I wish that Woods Runner was in, to be quite honest. But yeah, they had barely, some forty one. Bear this in mind days. when you hear people say that forty five is a squirrel rifle. David Crockett, the real David Crockett, killed hundred and twenty five black bears between eighteen twenty five and eighteen thirty five with a forty one caliber rifle. Yep. That's what I was saying. So, 40, 40 <laughs> caliber, 41, 42. Those were some actually pretty popular. Hey, they're talking about the really big squirrels, the one we don't see anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the thing so, about those rifles, too, with those oddball calibers is that each one of them is handmade. There was no standardization at all. Nope. Once that gunsmith usually... made that barrel, he made a bullet mold to go with that barrel. Yep. And yeah, whatever that's... caliber that was, that it's what it was. Yep. Mm-hmm. Usually you got the rifle mm-hmm. and the bullet mold. Yep. yep. And it could be 41. It could be 42 and a half. It could be 46. Um, that's what it uh, was... I was watching on Townsend's. Uh, they had a guy there was talking about it'd take, it was like a month and a half, two months pay for a rifle. Yep. So that's what people who are using rifles, I've, you would really, uh, really have to want one pretty bad. <laughs> well, yeah, and considering a Hawken rifle back in the day cost you forty-eight, to, well, anywhere between forty-five and fifty dollars. Mm-hmm. That's a couple months' pay right there. Oh yeah. But I think. Well, I mean, I think the thing. I think the thing with the rifle was is that it was so popular, and when your life depends on being able to put food on the table for your family, or if you're a long hunter, being able to get that buck in one shot. <laughs> it might be worth it. Right. But there's a lot of accounts of mountain men out here. They come out and they buy a fancy rifle, you know, and, you yeah. know, have a really good year trap and they buy a fancy. And the next year be a bad year trap oh, and they right. sell that rifle by a Northwest trade gun or a layman yep. trade rifle uh, in order to pay off their debts. Um, yep. So even though, you know, there was a few Hawkins out here in the fur trade, not very many, because they really didn't get started until the 1840s, but. Your few Hawkins, you know, all those fancy ones, they weren't that common. Yep. Yeah. Um, that kind of, God almighty, that that reminds me of when I was younger. I used to read all the, I think I talked with this with Garrett last night about uh, like the, Rev, the Civil War soldiers supply list, like whale oil for lubricating and cleaning guns. Um, mm-hmm. And I was reading when I was younger that 
I may be wrong on this. I think the Henry repeating rifle when it first came out was 20 or $40. I might be mistaken on those prices, one or the other. Um, but just think about that. You could get a Hawk in for 40 to $45 and a, a Henry was 20 to 40 also. And that was just mind blowing that firepower. Uh -huh. The Henry's went for about 80. 80. Yeah. 80. Yeah. So the yeah. Henry that we're going at the price you're thinking of, that's the cap lock Henry. That's not related to the lever action Henry. Oh, so like the rocket ball one then. No, no, no. This is oh, a muzzle no. loader. There was a JJ oh, okay. Henry company made yeah. cap locks and flint locks at the same time that the Hawkins were out. Well, he might also be talking about the difference between military price and civilian price. Is that, is that a thing? Um, no, they usually try to sell them pretty close to the same. Now, 20 to 40 might be what it costs the company to make them, but there are several accounts out here. And, and of course, this is the West, old West price. So the prices out in the West were a little bit higher, but there's a lot of guys that said, you know, they pay anywhere from 80 to a hundred dollars for a Henry rifle out here. No, now that I think about it, you're right, Duke. I think what I was quoting was that $20 was, I think the average union soldiers pay for a month. And I think you're right. The price was somewhere around $80 for a Henry. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just imagine saving up for four months to buy a rifle and then God knows how much for the ammo to get shipped to you right. from Connecticut. And not not just saving up, not spending a penny. Yeah. <laughs> well, but you know what? If I was one of those Union soldiers and all I had was a single shot rifle, then I can go to, say, a Henry. I would do it. I would save up. I'd probably go with the Spencer instead. Spencers are, yeah, that, that's the one I would want. But there was a lot of guys out here in the West, and, and I didn't realize how common the Henry rifle came out, but I thought they weren't that common until long after the Civil War. So, you know, getting towards 1870s. Yeah. They were really common out here amongst the civilians. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Excuse With me. That firepower alone Ooh, would be uh, the 1860s. The work of many. Okay, let me yeah, ask yeah, you guys this. Yeah. You can you guys what is your favorite uh TV or movie scene that involves a Henry that's an actual Henry? Easy. The scene in Dances with Wolves where somehow Kevin Postner managed to bring down a full grown buffalo with a single shot from a hundred yards with forty four Henry rim fire. <laughs> that got me dying of laughter. I don't know, that one with Robert Duvall, you know, Lonesome Dove where he shoots the the yeah. Uh, renegade, you know, at whatever it is, four or five, six hundred yards. That's that what I was enough. thinking of the lonesome dove scene. I'll, I'll throw you one here that is surprise, kind of a sleeper. Longmire, where his daughter is getting charged in through the house. Oh, the yeah, house. I forgot God. about that. He's literally Somehow. It was one of the most realistic moments I've ever seen. She picks that up, you know, she knows guns. She picks it up and she's screaming, Where's the loading gate? <laughs> <laughs> well, her dad, her dad carries that Winchester 94, so that's what she's probably looking for is that yep, King's loading like gate. And I just thought that was so well done for a TV series to do that nowadays. Yeah. And, and it was somebody who knew something about Henry's put that together because that was so good, I thought. And, well, Longmire was always really good with their firearms for, like, what they chose. If you look at, like, Vic, she had the uh, Glock because she's a Philadelphia cop. Um, mm -hmm. Berg because he was the fat kid in high school trying to be cool. Now had the Smith and Wesson model 29 and 44 yep. and the Pontiac yep. Firebird. You had. Hey, what you got against Grant. Pontiac wow. Firebird? Well, that's quite the well, combination no, there, just, Garrett. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's nothing against the Firebird. It's just he's trying to put off that cool yeah. kid in high school vibe. Ah. He's trying to be an 80s cop. Yeah, ah, and then you have you need the Ferrari um, three wait for that. You know have Branch else? who was carrying, I think, a Springfield XD or like a Smith and Wesson Sigma, something like that, and just a mm -hmm. un uh, Uncle Mike's holster is what I think they showed on the armors behind the scenes mm -hmm. feature. And then Longmire in his 1911, and the reason for that is a lot of people give it guff for being he's carrying a 1911. But in the book series, the Longmire book series, he's a Vietnam veteran who was an officer and carried a 1911. Yep. So that's yep. what he's familiar with, hence why he carries it. Show us the Longmire 1911, Duke. I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> you know he's got it. 
But yeah, that, the combination of a 1911 and a Winchester 3030 was just so cool for that character. It was very See, well done. It was. What I always thought Longmire should have carried, I don't think it should have been an 1894. I think he should have carried a Savage 99 or a Winchester 1895. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because a Winchester 1895, that'd be awesome. I because to that. me, that would kind of sell the Old West Sheriff in a more modern era than yeah. 1894. Mm -hmm. It, it would, but it might not be as iconic either. Oh, yeah, there True. you go. Yeah. yeah. I like to see that come out every now and then. I've shot yeah, that. Yeah. She's beautiful. She is beautiful. Um, Hurry. But, yeah, Longmire, it also... So they did a good job with their firearms on that show, but the first episode just always makes me really kind of cringe with their portrayal of the Sharps. Yeah, it was rusted up. Yeah, oh, my God. <laughs> Well, not Don't only get that, me started. The, not only that, but just like who, what's his name, Omar, the firearms expert, quote unquote, who says, "Oh, this slug, no, it, it could only come from like a sharps because it's a forty-five, and there's only one rifle shoots a gun, a uh, slug that big. It's like, <laughs> and he's yeah. the firearms expert. Uh, I just, I are we sure he isn't weird. the homeless guy from the next town over? Long, Longmire, Longmire was brave enough to take that thing clicking down, and because he was so confident, it was so rusted it wouldn't work, or however it went down, I don't remember. But I was like, "Whoo, you're awfully, you're awfully brave to think that." Well, it does. Well, when he dry fired, the first thing I thought is he just sheared that firing pin. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, he had a bullet loaded into it, so he wouldn't have. Uh, sheared off the firing pin i don't think but i think the thing he was trying to demonstrate is that because the gun was externally rusty i think he was trying to demonstrate that if the owner didn't take care of the rifle they probably didn't take care of the ammo so th i think it was more demonstrating that ammo yeah, that was a dud. that that could be but i still wouldn't trust my life <laughs> neither would i but still like i said that's i, I think you. they got better as the show went on yeah one of my favorites I mean, is where he's standing down the guy who has had the Glock and they're basically a Mexican standoff. And he's like, you do realize that was it? He has a single action trigger. Mine's a little more hair than yours. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Just a little bit. Speaking of Katie, that she's the daughter of Longmire, her Henry, you were speaking of earlier. It always kind of got on me that I get it. I don't know if it's a reproduction, but they were talking about Jacob half moon or, I think that was the character's name. The guy who gave it to her, the real scumbag. Jacob Nighthorse. Horse. Night Horse, thank you. Um, yeah. But with him, he seems the type that he would own an actual original Henry to me. Yeah. And that's what he would have on display because that, that's like the esteem, the prestige that he would want of having an yeah. original heirloom Henry. And they show her loading 4440... Uh, Winchester centerfire ammo into this thing. And I get it. It's you aren't going to load 44 Henry rim fire, but, and also I do understand there were centerfire conversions for the Henry's later on down the line. I think Ian McCollum just did a video on that a couple months ago, but I don't know to me, it just, at that point you might as well make it a Henry golden boy instead of a original or a Winchester golden boy instead of a yellow boy instead of a Henry well, yeah. you got to remember yeah. when that American Henry came out, people couldn't get it. It was prestige. And whoever's running that show knows something about guns. And yeah. it was, when that American Henry came out and Hickok was the first one to get one, I think, or like one of the early guys to get the engraved American Henry, that was pretty prestigious, I thought. Yeah. But you're yeah. right. You're right. I would think that uh, I would think he would have an original in there, too. Um, but well, I handled one of them yeah. American Henry's today. The price is prestigious. <laughs> Five yeah. thousand dollars. And actually, you birdie makes a little bit more accurate copy. Yeah, yeah. I hey, think Garrett, uh, we got a uh, we got a discount from Henry for our next Henry purchase. What was it ten percent? <laughs> we could knock it down to like. I don't know, forty five hundred dollars. <laughs> they take five percent off your purchase every time you mention Henry on a live stream, Henry. Yeah. Henry, 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 Henry. <laughs> no, I just I got a let I did a couple of Henry reviews and I got a letter from him with a coupon. Man. But Henry, um, uh, the Henry Twenty Two Company is probably the most YouTuber friendly. Uh, uh you know the Twenty Two. Yeah, I mean they support everybody. You know they they go out and find YouTubers. 
<laughs> so so here's a question heritage 22 be, revolvers is pretty close yeah here's a question i think will start a pretty good debate an 1892 rossi or a new production Winchester 1892 Trapper Carbine, which one would you rather have? Because on one hand, the Rossi only costs about $700, but the Winchester costs, I think, double, the, double that to maybe t double and a half. I think it's like 1700 bucks. But on the other hand, you have the Clinton safety on the Rossi. You don't have that with the Winchester. I'm going to say... Um, I am about to say there's going to be two different groups of people here. There's going to be Duke who would absolutely have to go with the uh, Winchester because of all the reenacting he does. And then there's going to be people like me that would absolutely go with the Rossi just because I really think they're cheap and I like a stainless steel lever action. And you can take that safety out if you want. And I've had one for 15 years and I love it. So go ahead, Duke. <laughs> and I was going to say the Winchester just because I've handled both and, and, uh, the new Winchester company is out of Japan. When they first got started, they were a little rough, but now they are top of the line. Uh, they was even making 66s and 73s there for a short time. I don't know if they still are or not, but I was thinking about a 66 from them. Um, yeah, I was. I yeah. really wanted to get one of their 66s in. Like, uh, I think they offered them in 45 Long Colt. I really wanted to get one of those because I'm a sucker for the 66. Yeah, so let, to just to clarify your question there, so uh, let, let's put it in a, in a set of circumstances where it's just an average working man going out and ha wants a lever action, uh, pistol caliber carbine to hunt deer, whatever, in the woods. I would honestly tell him to get the Rossi because I don't think spending the extra three, t t over twice as much is getting you that much more for the Winchester. Right. Not reenacting, not nothing, just going out and using it. What do you think? Yeah, just for use. And it's kind of like what I tell people on the cap and ball revolvers, too. If you're just going to do it for shooting, you know, go with a cheaper route, go with a Pieta. Uh, they'll out, they'll run or outrun the Winchesters or the U Birdies out there. Um, but, you know, if you want something that looks nice, pay the higher price. You know, here's the thing I would probably, if Winchester, like if Moroku opened an American branch, and started making them back in Connecticut again, oh. I would probably have to go with Winchester all, every day of the week. Oh. I, uh, I have, a, I have a, a love for the Rossi just because so many people hate it. <laughs> and generally yeah. the people who hate it have never even fired an original Winchester. But for some reason they have, you know, the holier than thou for someone who shoots a Rossi. Now I've shot just about every original Winchester you can shoot, uh, you know, and originals and olds and, you know, especially the old ones. I have a 73 original sitting right there, but I like to bring it Rossi out and everybody's always like, well, that's a junk gun. I'm like, have you ever even shot an original? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's know? because yeah. from about 2008 to about 2012, um, them Rossi's had a really bad reputation and I handled a couple of them. It's like, you had to send them off. Uh, I don't remember who the guy was. There was a guy that, that would fix them for you. You had to send them to him because they basically the factory was taking the parts, rough milled, throwing them together in a gun, and sending it out the door. There was no fitting on it. Yep. And uh, that but, that gave them the bad name, and that bad name still are. And the same thing happened with Marlin when Marlin changed hands. However many years ago, um, the. Uh, uh, what do they call it? The 4570 lever action one, uh, the Alaskan and all them. They had a bad rap when it changed hands because they were they were junk guns coming out of the factory. But then once they Marty, got things squared away, you know, they're pretty decent guns now. Well, we, we could give you two stories on that because I bought my Rossi in 2010. And it's, well, Caleb has it now, but it's just the slick, smoothest. And I've never had trouble with it. Ethan bought a Marlin around a year later. Model 336. No, it would have yeah. been in a – that would have been in, like, 2009. Yeah. Yeah, 2009 that so I got that Marlin Model 336. It was junk. And that thing, it didn't – they never – they had portions in that receiver. They had not finished machining out. That's how bad it was. You could load maybe 
every now and then you get a couple of rounds to go, but it jammed and jammed. And when it jammed, you had to take the whole thing apart. Yeah, That's why I so, traded it for my uh, AK. So this is my Rossi 92. I think Snapper and Garrett saw it last night, but this is the stainless steel trapper or carbine model they have. And one of the things they're notorious for at this point is they're in 357 and 38 special. If you use 38 special, it'll try and double feed the cartridges if the yep. cartridge itself is too long. I fired about 500 rounds of all sorts of different hand loads in this thing, uh, varying different sizes, and I've never once had a jam in it or a double feed. And hey, granted, hey. that's not a whole lot of rounds, but just I, that's exclusively 38 special because I can't get 357 in my area. Um, yeah. I think that they've really improved their quality recently, which is kind of why I took the chance on this one. Even with that ridiculous, stupid safety on it, I mean – it already has half cock. Why do I need a safety on the top of the bolt? Mm -hmm. um, you can importation laws. And you but, can take that uh, out. You can. Yeah. Um, it all comes down this, to importation laws. This, mm -hmm. however, yep. is my Winchester 94. This was made in 1905. Still has a good barrel in it. It's a little worn, obviously, because it's made in turn of the century. But it's oh, it was my one of the first lever actions I ever owned and it was given to me by my grandfather. And this may be a bit controversial just because I know the 94 is just this iconic Americana rifle. But to me, the 92 is a far better design. I understand it's a little bit more complex because of the design of John Browning's bolt face and the dual locking lugs. But to me, it's a far smoother, far better feeling action than the 1894, where for some reason with the 1894, when you rack this lever, like my neighbor, I won't give his name, obviously, because, you know, streaming privacy sake, he just inherited one from his father-in-law, and that was made in like 1953, so still a pre-64. He found out that if you don't work that lever like you mean it, it won't properly feed the round because you have to have that last little click. So it's almost like a two stage lever, but at the same time, if you work it too aggressively, it pops the round into the top of the chamber and it, you have to basically get a rubber mallet to whack that thing back down to let it feed properly. I've never had that issue with the 1892 just because it's such a smooth action. It's such a smooth transition from opening the bolt to kicking up the cartridge elevator. So it may be a little controversial, but I think the 1892 and the, I think the 1892 action is far superior to the 1894. Well, well basically the 92 was the 86 shortened down. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the 94 was kind of that happy medium of we can get a longer round in a shorter in frame. In the same receiver. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, it's you're giving away that because you were going from a black powder pistol around cartridge. It was worth it. The extra, everything they had to do inside that action was worth it to get the smokeless 30, 30, uh, you know, high powered round for the day. But yeah, he yeah. had to do a lot of reworking to make it fit in that receiver for the 90. Oh well, yeah. I mean, just look at the Winchester 1895 action where basically they have a goddamn or sorry from language, but they have an origami or a freaking uh, yoga style freaking trigger guard and trigger mechanism where it just folds out the bottom of the rifle or the 1887, where the only way John Browning could make that entire lever action shotgun concept work was to literally have the entire guts of the receiver come out the bottom with the lever throw. Yeah, Soylent Green's in here. He's hi, Soylent. I haven't hey, seen you. Soylent. I like to click on his picture because we can see Charlton Heston. He said, "I wish Rozzy <laughs> still made their Colt pump reproduction." I didn't know they didn't make that anymore. Uh, you already got the rights to it. Oh, and he said, Rossi. "Only bad part about '86 and '92 are the complicated takedown and reassembly, like most Browning designs." We were talking oh, about that yeah. last night. Actually, yeah, that was funny. We were discussing how Ethan said you could always tell John Browning design if you opened it up and took you three hours to put it back together. Yeah. <laughs> or excuse well, me, it wasn't you, Bertie, that got the rights to it. It was Petter Soli. Oh, I see. Uh, hey, Ross Garrett, I'm going to I'm gonna have to get Go going soon, buddy. All right. Well, we're about to close it down anyway. We're right at 159, almost two hours. We've had a lot of fun. Okay. What you got so, there? 
I don't know if this is what he was talking about, but this Rossi actually does still make a pump action, but it's a 22 gallery. Um, they stopped making the old Colt and Winchester style ones. Um, I think it's just because it got too expensive, the materials and the actual design. So they really simplified it down. Let me do a, okay. Yeah, I got this one loaded up. This is my squirrel gun. Very, very well, nice. Rabbit and garden gun. So you can see here, it's based on like the 1897 style action. Yeah. Right. It's a, and, uh, it's a, is that a copy of a 98? Uh, not a 98. Uh, 18, 90? It's a Winchester copy. I know that of the Winchester 22. Not so much because the Winchester 90s popped off the top like it... Uh, yeah. I don't know how to describe it, but... Is that one, no, this that one doesn't like, eject out the top? No, it's, it ejects out the side, but I would oh, say okay. this is more... I would say it's more similar to like the uh, later... I think it was Remington pump actions that were designed by John Peterson. Mm-hmm. And the only difference is this one still has the hammer, whereas the Peterson guns were hammerless. They were internal yeah. hammered. And yeah, Rossi does still make pump action 22s. It's just not as high quality. Like the receiver is stamped aluminum. The bolts still steal though. The here's the killer of it. I didn't realize this when I picked up this little 22, um, the, trunnions i guess that you would call them uh basically the rings that hold the barrel and the magazine tube into the receiver are basically cast z mac and yeah. have a habit of shearing off ethan smiling about that no i'm reading the comments <laughs> yeah <laughs> great pilgrim uh i'll read a couple more of these comments guys we're about to close down here in just a couple minutes snappers gotta go so if you got any more questions comments throw them in there sorry i haven't been reading everybody's but we've been having a good conversation here brass 762 said got a winchester 94 made in 63 my grandfather bought in germany on a military base and had a german gunsmith engrave and silver inlay it Woo, that's Ooh. nice uh, Gray Wolf said he also has a, a Merku uh, 4570, 1886, the big 92. Yes. Uh, iPod Walker said something about Mossberg. Uh, Franklin Horse said, I have that gallery gun. I saw three of them at the gun store the other day. I was kind of impressed with them, with that uh, I'd, pump action Rossi. Like I said, Garrett, I'd probably pass on it if I were you, just because I already kind of, to me, the price isn't bad, but the fact that the internals yeah. are all Z Mac and they have a habit of shearing off to where you have basically a free floating barrel in all the wrong ways. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, is Henry still making the 22 pump action? I think they are, but I think it's usually like a seasonal thing. I think they only start the production up around Christmas. I think it's kind of okay. like. Task Force yeah. Tyler's got a question for you. Uh -oh. Where's he at? Oh, Task Force Tyler. So this may sound a bit sorry, then I have to read this. This may Go sound ahead. a bit random, but how accurate are the guns in Red Dead Redemption 2? He wants to start this conversation at the end. Here we go. <laughs> this way oh you boy. You pull them cartridges out of your wrist, they're just automatically there and they slide <laughs> right into the cylinder. But if we're yeah. going that route, I mean, there there has to be sacrifices to accuracy for gameplay yeah. purposes. You know, that's like Again, it's the happy medium where if you play the old Civil War Nation United game from History Channel, that was somewhat accurate with their reloading when they had single shot muskets. And I remember I yep. hated playing that game for it when I was a teenager. I loved it yep. because it was history based, but the reloads were just a massive pain. So I wound up making most of the way through the campaign using the Bowie knife or the uh, cavalry saber. Hey, like I played uh, Escape from Tarkov for a little bit. And that game, if they kill you, you lose all your gear. So before you know it, I kept on getting with these players who were real good, and I started out with a really nice AK and everything. By the time it was said and done, I had a bolt-action 20-gauge shotgun and a knife. <laughs> That's, I, I played I gear. Right, what I was thinking. She says, like, the Winchester 62A. Yes, that's kind of what I was thinking. I was thinking yeah. 90, but the 90s got the hammer and the... Yeah, uh, that's so what I was thinking. Was I think got wrong though when it comes to Red Dead is the single action army should have been one of the more powerful pistols in the game, and it's yeah. always the weak, it's yeah. like the weak first pistol you get. And it's it's that's completely there is, there is, I and the volcanic is like the most powerful. <laughs> there is I one can... thing about that that I really liked, and there was a secret thing that Caleb actually discovered. You can go into a secret room in there, and there's like some sort of 
deal going down between these outlaws, and there's this case, and if you and it's Schofield, if you deal, it's a yeah. tool room Smith and Wesson side fold out uh, model three, and I, Caleb pulled that out. He's like, "Oh, well, this is weird," and he opens them up, and I'm like, "I knew what it was." Me and Caleb looked at each other, and we're like, "We got the one." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, um, seriously, I got the uh, auto five and the crag and I never look back. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much my loadout. Um, especially with slugs for the auto five, but I use the auto five with slugs and then the, uh, I use the Evans. What kind of drove me nuts uh-huh. was the fact that I didn't add the Evans or the Lamat revolvers in until almost a year after the game dropped. And those were my two go-tos after those got added into the game because the little mat was just massively OP, especially if you loaded it with slugs for the under barrel, which mm-hmm. I mean, th- the weird thing about that was the little mat is accurately portrayed as a muzzle loader somewhat because you see Arthur yeah. Morgan holding it, putting something in the front of the cylinder running the, and it's, it's very much kind of a rush job well, by rockstar for gameplay purposes but you can still see it is somewhat a muzzle loading firearm in game mm-hmm. so how in the hell is arthur morgan loading a 12 gauge slug into that barrel <laughs> yeah. round ball you gotta realize too the 51 <laughs> navy is in that okay, game but ball. only on the online and the 51 yeah. navy if you watch that slow down he actually it's almost like he's loading paper cartridges he'll shove it in there and then boop, 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 boop. you know he actually goes through the steps and even puts a cap on well, well, I, I mean, like how you also powerful talk... the volcanic is. Yeah, I know. I thought that was <laughs> that funny. Somehow... Volcanic, man, that thing's a hand cannon. It is All like the most powerful pistol in the entire game, I believe, is the volcanic. And Gentlemen, All answer me this. How is it the volcanic re- uh, repeating pistol ejects cases when it's a caseless case, ammunition? Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. And so it's weak like that a man tried to commit suicide and shot himself in the head, like, what, five times before he gave up the cause? <laughs> Yeah, and he was still yep. awake and, and alert when they found him. You know, it was like, you know, that Smith, was impressive. Smith and Wesson designed that, dude. And then, you know, yeah. it was a, Smith and Wesson was the Schofield where he was successful. I'm drawing the conclusion that Smith and Wesson designers shoot themselves in the head or investors. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's. Oh, you mean like Roland White? Well, he didn't shoot himself in the head, but I don't know if he did or not. I bet he probably wishes he did with the amount of money he had to yeah. spend on the patent. Yeah, the amount defense. of money he lost. <laughs> yep. You know, Manhattan uh, Arms Company was about to make him bankrupt. You know, uh, you guys have heard of the being one of the most Walter successful Walter, gun right? patents in history. He didn't make any real money off of it at all because he was fighting to keep any money he made from it. Yep. Yeah. It's pretty sad. Pretty sad. Um, yep. But you guys have heard of the Walch revolver from the Civil War, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. The double the, the double guy- hammer. Yeah, the double hammer that used superimposed charges, like the same yep. technology they used in like the fifteen hundreds on wheel locks. And there's a story of a uh, Confederate soldier got one from home. He tried shooting a pig to feed his unit. He shot the thing like 12 times and it was still up and running around. <laughs> That's volcanic power right there. Oh, man. <laughs> now you're playing with power. Volcanic power. Great. power. Hey, well, the yeah. next makes the bone savage cabin ball. No. Oh, not the- That's their, their saying, volcanic saying is volcanic power. Volcanic um, power. I, I'm gonna. I kind of have an. Uh, he's talking about that savage. I, I've kind of got something in my mind going on because I handled one at a gun show one time, and we all talked about besides, of course, the Remingtons and the Colts. Uh, I would agree that probably the best made cap and ball revolver was the Rogers and Spencer, but it wasn't available to use. I think that Savage is a well-made gun. I don't care what anybody says. Yep. I think that Savage it's, is a very well-made gun. It's a well-made gun, but it's very much a kludge of a system to me. We have to acknowledge that the Star Double Action and the Savage were kind of a kludge way to get double action into early revolvers just because they hadn't really refined the process yet, the mechanism. Well, yeah, everybody forgets they're... about the Remington Double Action that was at about the same time period. The rider. Hmm. Well, here's the difference. The star is well known for breaking down and everybody hating it. I haven't seen hardly any records of the Savage breaking down and people hating it. As a matter of fact, people kind of liked it. And like you say, it was the kludge of a system to use two fingers. But, you know, it's uh, I think it's a well-built gun. I've just here lately been studying on it a little bit. Might have to get one of those in. Well, you know, I remember, right, yeah. And they just couldn't keep up with the production on it. 
Yeah, you know the spare double action? It actually, you pull it back far enough that technically your trigger is just cocking it and your trigger actually touches the sear to drop the hammer. That's actually how the double action in the Colt works for a yeah, very it, long time. You can't see it, so, but on the inside, when you're pulling the trigger, all you're doing is cocking the hammer. And yeah, so right like at the that. very end where the sear just, it, there's a little nub that touches the sear that it backs either, if, if you didn't have the sear in there so you can cock it, um, you know, that, that allows it to drop. But if you just pull the trigger, it would drop on its own from the bar. But that's how it works. It's, it's a little nub that it, in, inside the frame that touches the sear that causes it to drop. Isn't Great, that true on the Smith & Wessons too? I what? don't know much about Smith & Wesson double actions that much. Uh, yeah. Gray Wolf said he'd love to have a Savage, and it was not a double action. Technically, yeah. no, but I like to say it like uh, Ian says it, almost double action. Yeah. It's, uh, Semi it's not double so action. Shocking, granted, Semi. But yeah, it's, it's, it's what I would action. consider part of the early double action. It's a one and a half action. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Semi -double Triple action. action. <laughs> no, you're talking about you had to use two fingers to pull the trigger. I automatically started thinking of that Colt 1902 Alaskan or Philippine model with the oh, trigger yeah. like that long. Well, yeah. massive the hand finger guard. The difference in the Star and the Savage is you could cock the hammer on the Savage with your thumb. On the Star, you actually have to be pulling the trigger at a certain point to cock the hammer with your thumb. It doesn't go all the way. You break it. Yeah. If you try to cock um, it, off. so it, that's the difference. That's a terrible thing for a star. I think we can all agree, though, when it comes to the reproduction and reenactment scene, every in terms of like Italy, all these manufacturers. We were discussing this a bit last night, Garrett. Was the issue we tend to see is everyone makes the 1851 clones, everyone makes 1860s, the Remington uh, 1858s. But outside of that, there isn't a whole lot of variety in terms of reenacting anymore. It's mostly those main three revolvers that you see. Um, there are some scum, some companies that still do make re, uh, reproductions of things like the Star. But it's long since been kind of outmoded because people just want the standard, uh, mm -hmm. the old standbys. You know, me personally, like I said, my dream would be opening a firearm manufacturing firm that focuses on those old reproduction firearms, mm -hmm. uh, making a 4440 reproduction or a 44 Magnum reproduction of the volcanic repeating pistol, or, you know, making an actual modern uh, pepper box revolver that has replaceable nipples instead of one of those ones. That's like the 1851 frame with an extended cylinder. Yeah. That'd be so, cool. And we, you were talking about that. You said you also wanted to start cranking out 44 Henry. I'll be here in line when you start doing that. <laughs> uh -huh, but I have to win the Powerball before I do that, or I have to, you know, get a massive inheritance from a long lost relative. Yeah, I want to figure out a way to do that myself because I really want a 72 open top. The N44 yeah, Henry. 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 Yep. Uh, I never met a gun I didn't like then. Hi. Hey. Uh, Pieta's website says coming soon under the star listing of firearms. Fingers crossed. That'd Ooh, be cool. That'd be cool. Here's yeah. the mind issue they're going to have with it. They're going to bring that dude out at $1,500. Yeah. At least. <laughs> and you can I mean, almost buy an original for that. Because what, the Lamats are sitting at, what, just about 1500 right now? Or yeah, but you can't exactly get a Lamat for 1500 bucks. I don't think that I've seen. Usually they're, what, double that, depending on yep. the auction you see them in? Yeah, they're they're so they used to be a dime a dozen. You could find them under around a thousand dollars forever, and now, yeah, yeah, you can't find one if you wanted well, one. When you I think blame that for West video World. on it. The Lamat and the Patterson; those are two that they should do because, like, the originals are just so expensive. So, yeah, but a lot of the little ling and ding ones, you know, literally by the time they make it and they charge you fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred for it, you could buy. An original, like take for instance the Smith and Wesson Model Threes they got now. I mean, mm -hmm. if you bought a Russian, a Smith and Wesson Model Three Russian, what can you get that for now, Ethan? Twelve hundred bucks, something like that. Original, original, like with a uh, not not well, an American, a Russian. Depends on the uh, depends on the quality or not the quality, but the condition of the gun. But for one that's kind of in a rougher condition, that but still shootable, uh, yeah, you could get one for twelve hundred bucks. So uh, what I'm saying is they're literally charging on some of those guns. They got to charge more than what some originals bring at auction. Right. So yeah, I think that's why they don't make the 1877 double actions because that, yeah, not that's working the one. Yeah. Cause you can get one of those for 800 bucks. 
Yep. Yeah. So, and that's the Colt Light. Uh, well, as, the long Colt, as, uh, as long as your brother's not in Gunbroker at any time, you can find one for around 800 bucks. But once he's there, those are all gone. <laughs> what were you yeah. going to say? What, what was that? Uh, I, God, the name of it is lost on me right now. The Colt Pump Action, like 4440. And it's actually those... called the Colt Lightning, too. There's a Colt Lightning yeah. revolver. I was questioning that for a second, but my thing is they, I think Taylor and co makes re or they buy reproductions from Italy of it, but I've seen the prices on those things. And I think I was looking at one and it was like, uh, don't quote me on this. It was either like 15, 1700 bucks on their website, or it was like three grand, something like that. It was well, ridiculous what? price. Mm -hmm. And you, I've seen those <laughs> sell at auction for 2000 originals yeah. in fairly good condition. What so is it? A lightning rifle. Oh, lightning the rifle. rifle. Yeah, yeah. Hardy's Hardy's hat's got a question here, Garrett. You might want to read it about thirty-two rim fire. I see one about twenty-two blanks, or, for, or about rim. Yeah, about rim fire ammunition. He said we need to put all put our heads together, figure out how to reload rim fire without shoving a twenty-two blank into the case head. Tell him, Ethan, how you do it. Oh, it's doable. It yeah. is doable. The uh, only thing is that it... you'll eventually run out of rim. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you can same... open it up a couple times, but once you do that so many times, it's gonna yeah. it's gonna start. To burn on you. What what he's talking about, Hardy Hat, is you can do it by stuffing and repacking it with match heads. Yeah, yeah. Well, well there's different things you can use. They actually have a, a priming solution that you yeah. can use. We've used it before, but we actually went and bought some smokeless rounds, pulled the bullets out of them, and reloaded them with. Uh, the correct Elmer Keith load for 32 rimfire, 13 grains of 3F. And yeah, they worked pretty good. Put them back in there. And then I used my uh, bullet puller. I went and I modified uh, Larry Potterfield. I talked about it. I modified it so that I could tighten it down and actually recrimp that healed bullet. Yeah. It worked really well. I don't know. How much did that box of 32 rimfire cost you, like the <laughs> uh, modern? A lot. A lot. Uh, how much did that cost, Caleb? Two hundred fifty bucks for fifty. Two hundred fifty dollars for fifty rounds. So yeah. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. No, I was gonna say you could probably do the same with the original forty-four Henry rimfire ammo, but the thing is, by now I think the last boxes of forty-four rimfire were rolled out in the thirties, and yeah, I don't think anyone's gonna be rushing to go to like a auction site to buy an original sealed box of forty-four Henry rimfire to repack yep. it and shoot it. Mm -hmm. And who knows if the powder in it's any good either. So, well, that's the thing is if you're repacking the uh, ammo, if you're just uh, right. pulling the bullet and pouring in more uh, new powder, the thing well, is you'll have the, to... Uh, the actual rimfire... Uh, you yeah, know, the, the primer. ...powder that sets off the ignition. It, who knows if that's even good inside of the rim. Yep. Yeah, you would have to repack the rim because you the don't know thing. what condition that ammo was stored. And you could have had something that was in Grandpa's barn for 100 years. Mm -hmm. And then you yeah, want to be careful taking that stuff out of there because that is actual mercury fulminate. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And if it is that. still good, <laughs> you want to soak it first. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Garrett, and most did, uh, of we the did a... smoke, or most Garrett's of the rimfire stuff you find nowadays smokeless, so you got to pull it anyway. Yeah. Garrett's first video that he did, Garrett or Garrett's first video, was on a '97 Winchester. You remember that, Garrett? Yeah. Yeah. A paper, a bunch of paper. Yeah, he had a paper shell, and we we're like, yeah, this I had shell's a, about a bunch of years 19, old. 1920s paper shells. I shot through it, buckshot. Mm. So we, he put that paper shell in his buckshot, put that paper buckshot shell into that shotgun, watched the shot on the phone camera come out of the barrel, hits a soda pop can, and actually would not puncture all the way through. Just went through one side of it, and it's like, yeah, that ammo got old real quick. So. Somewhere See, I thought you were going to say the whole shell went with it and it separated from the brass hole. No, no, it held together, I, but it was just so. Shells, but... It was just so old, and that ammo had gotten wet or something, and it just barely just kind of, just kind of yeah. rolled out the barrel. See, well, guys, I'm a sucker gonna... for the old. Uh, I'm a sucker for the old brass shells, like the full brass uh, twelve gauge oh, shells. Those I just love. Yeah. Yeah, Caleb just yep. bought a box of those, uh, the Ducks Unlimited box of all brass shells. I think he gave 70 bucks for 25 and then we went to the gun store 
uh, not too long later, and they had the same box, and they wanted three hundred and fifty bucks for it, and we were like, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, guys, we got to think about closing it down here because it looks like yeah. uh, Snapper's got to go. Yeah, uh, I got to go. go. Let's go around here, Snapper. You got anything coming out? You've been putting out some pretty good videos here lately. Uh, believe it or not, the uh, Griswold Gunnison video is actually done, and Woo! I just haven't had a date to release it. Well, let us know so we can advertise for you. I, I sure will. Um, expect within probably the next two weeks, as long as nothing crazy happens here. But it's done. I can just put it to come out whenever. Yep. Duke, you got a book review coming out? Uh, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I know you got a new book. <laughs> yeah, I got a few. Yeah. And uh, what about you, Iron Wings? You got any new videos coming out you can tell us about? You thinking about? Uh, so what I'm working on right now is a couple of reviews. I already told you I'm working on the Rossi 92. I'm looking at trying to disprove the uh, long-standing myth that the 38 feed, because this is a literally less than year old production rifle. So I'm trying to work up like a dozen different hand loads for 38 of different case links to just show that that kind of issue has resolved itself over time. I'm also looking at doing an accuracy test. I have to find some 357 brass before I can do it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some hand loads and shoot it out of this 1892, load it to the 3840 specification, so a 188 grain, uh, 180 grain lead round nose ball going at about 1,100 feet per second, just for accuracy and to see how it works out of this Rossi, the, what the accuracy would be. Yeah, very good. Uh, you guys stay tuned in here tomorrow morning at 7.30 or 7 o'clock if you're on Rumble. Uh, you will see Ethan see just how far he can take a brown bus with a 200-grain charge and hit a man-sized target and just keep backing up, and it's a pretty good video. It's the I'm first video he's here. really first video What's he's that? really put together since he got back, and I was watching it the other morning, and I was like, wow, my quality is nothing compared to this. So you guys be watching. It's going to be an awesome video. Anyway, yeah, that opening you put on that, Ethan, it just gives me all nostalgic. <laughs> so anyway, guys, uh, anybody got anything else to say? It's good to have you back, Ethan. Really nice seeing you all, man. It's good to be back. <laughs> it's nice to, be to have Iron Wing. Tell, yeah, tell, nice them, tell them your channel name again so they can go subscribe to you, Iron Wings. Yeah, that's Iron Wings 3187 over here on YouTube. Um, again, Garrett, I really appreciate coming on. Just... Uh, first live stream i've really been on other than another friend's channel and it's been a lot of fun talking with you guys just because of that shared common interest i may not get a lot right but i know enough to get me in danger um so <laughs> i thought you did really for, really well <laughs> so thanks for having me on garrett and just uh it's fun talking to duke and these guys but try and get me on with santi i think that'd be a lot more fun <laughs> we'll see what we can do about that <laughs> We'll I, I'm just joking with you guys. It's been actually a great pleasure. So I really do appreciate you guys having me on. All right. Well, we're glad you came on. We appreciate you taking the time and giving us some of your knowledge because you did have a lot of interesting knowledge there, especially on those uh, every man's guns. And I do appreciate that. Anyway. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Trust in God. Keep the powder dry. Bye. Bye. <laughs>